as there is no quorum requirement for the annual fall town meeting and the town clerk is present to make record of the proceedings the chair calls to order the 2017 fall town meeting at 702 p.m. As voters are still checking in and taking their seats, I would ask you to remain as quiet as possible. And we will start with a few announcements to give voters a chance to check in and get their seats before we begin with the items on the warrants. First announcement will be from the Nonprofit Council, represented by Mr. Jack Petropoulos and Mr. Neil Kanth Mishra. Mr. Petropoulos, your announcement, please. Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, we started a tradition every year of giving a report from Groton's Nonprofit Council. We normally do that at the spring town meeting, but last town meeting was really full and we determined to put it off until the fall meeting, so we'll do that here. Um, the report highlights the work of its members. This year, uh, and as every year, one of its members gives a special report on the activities of their nonprofit association. That will be N Neil Kanth Mishra of the New England Shri Sai Temple. But first I want to do an overview of the coalition's work for the year. The work really tends to divide itself between issues of land and issues of service. These services are often invisible. You don't see them, you take them for granted, but as I go through you'll see that they're very important, important contributions. It's the issues of land that I think we might really overlook. This town values little more than, it's, than the land that it has and the, the, the character that that land gives us. And many of these nonprofits contribute amazingly to that character. Let's start with the Groton Community School, who gives high school uh, scholarships to graduates of high schools and has been hosting high school internships this year. The Mountain Lakes Club, in its 80th year this year, owns and maintains that field up at the Lakes Club and has family events, including this year, open to everybody, the Halloween party. The Groton Historical Center this year has started an initiative to build a park behind the Historical Center, the Boutwell House. This, pub this park will have public access and will be the only public view of Gibbet Hill. Seven Hills. Seven Hills is constantly working with police and fire to demonstrate their, Seven Hills, gratitude for the work and safety that the police and fire departments give to Seven Hills. This feedback is unmatched in demonstrating their, uh, to our public safety officials how they're valued and the value of their receiving that feedback is unmatched. The Groton School. The Groton School this year purchased 66 acres of land along Farmer's Row known as the Gunderson land. They did that at no cost to the town with the interest only in preserving it. Had that land come before town meeting, we would have been asked to spend a significant amount of money. The Groton School preserved that for us. They do a ton of additional community service work at the country club, town playgrounds, and more. Indian Hill Music, this year, one of our newest nonprofit members. This year, the, Indian Hill, Indian Hill, the folks at Indian Hill undertook to rebuild a stone wall along Old Air Road. It's another defining feature as people enter into our property. It had fallen into disrepair. They've undertaken to restore it and are getting compliments every day on it. And the wall is now coming to be known as the Great Wall of Groton. <laughs> Lawrence Academy. Lawrence Academy has forever uh, allowed us to use their facilities for educational, cultural, and sporting events. Many of you probably go to soccer or basketball, etc. there, and don't think about what the contribution that the Lawrence Academy gives in letting that be, those facilities be used by our kids. Um, but along the, the terms of land um, contributions, this year Lawrence Academy <laughs> undertook an enormous project to revise their front entrance. Sure, that was for them, that was their front entrance. But like so many other things, that entrance comes to, comes to um, symbolize what our downtown looks like. And I think we all value it more than we really think of every day as we drive by. The Groton Conservation Trust, over 50 years, has preserved over 1,600 acres of conservation land. This year, they had many, in addition to the work that they do to maintain that land and acquire new land, 
They held celebrations in the general field, vernal pool walks on the throne, and an owl's event at Williams Barn. Lastly, the National River Watershed Association has led the effort to have the Nashua, the Nisitissit, and the Squanicook declared wild and scenic rivers. If this initiative is successful, it will bring additional resources to our town and to the surrounding towns to preserve these valuable resources. They've also secured special funding to address stormwater impact to developing, and to developing solutions for addressing the stormwater impact. These are serious contributors to, to water quality and to erosion. So um, I'd like to take this opportunity again to introduce Neil Kenth, and Neil Kenth will tell you a little bit about the temple. Thank you, Jack. And uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Nilkant Mishra, and I'm a member of the Groton Nonprofit Council, as mentioned by the Jack. And I also represent the NASSP, the Shirdi Sai Temple, being constructed in this town of Groton. <coughs> I want to thank the town officials and you all, the citizens of the town, for all the help and the support that is being provided for the smooth construction of the temple. The temple is almost ready and the inauguration will happen for a week along celebration starting November 19th to November 26th. And the main event will happen on November 23rd and I would like to invite the Groton people to come and watch the rituals that goes in the inauguration of this temple on November 23rd. Along with that, we are also planning to have an explicit open house tour for the Groton people to come and see the temple. And following the base principle of our temple and the deity and the philosophy of our Sai Baba, we are working on some community service initiatives in the town, and few of them are listed like, we are going to plant some trees in the town. For this, we are in touch with the tree warden, Mr. Tom, and the friends of the trees. We are also planning to provide meal for the senior citizens, our seniors, and in this regard, we are already discussing with the Kathy Shelf, the director of the Council of Aging. We are also thinking to sponsor the scholarship for our students in the town. And in this regard, we had few email exchange and communication with the Groton School Committee Chair, Marlena Gilbert. We hope to continue spreading the Sai Baba philosophy of faith, patience, community harmony, and love. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator, and the town of Groton for your support. Thank you very much. With an announcement from the Groton Dunstable School Committee, its chair, Marlena Gilbert. Good evening. I just wanted to basically, well, the school committee wanted to summarize some things that we've been up to thus far. We're only about seven weeks into school, but we did hit the ground running. We also wanted to give you an update in regards to the audit that we're doing of the entire district. So for starters, I just wanted to remind everyone why we even started here with the audit. Uh, we have uh, some needs in our district. We did not have an override that passed in order to fund, the, fund these needs. So we are now looking within our own budget as requested to try and find any, any possible ways to reallocate funds so that way we can basically fund the things that we do need in our schools. Eventually we will come to a point where additional funding will be needed from, from taxpayers, but at this point we want, we're, we want to show step by step exhausting every possibility before we do that. So the status of the audit is, Abrams has finished the audit for the items that you see above facilities, building transportation, technology, food service, and building utilization. 
That was done and completed. It's on our website. October 15th is the final report. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to touch upon the findings. There is a printout of this presentation uh, outside of the doors. Um, we only have a short period of time allotted to me to present to you, so please bear with me as the speed that I'm going to go through these. DJM is handling the curriculum staffing and special education. They will actually be finishing up around about mid-December, and that will also be on the school website for previews. Um, generally, it will be circulated throughout the town, both towns, so they can all see the progress of that. Some of the highlights of the key findings, and you'll see there's, there's, there's basically a, a segue going through all of these. Um, buildings and maintenance, they found that we're doing an adequate job in regards to the minimal, minimal amount of staff that we have right now. Building utilization, we have the MSBA. MSBA is, is an application that we applied for, hoping to get some support in renovating or rebuilding Florence Roach. If we will find out in December where we stand in that, if we will continue in that process, or if we will have to reapply again. But it is a way for us to try and get some state funds to reimburse us for the cost of that. And we'll keep you in tuned in regards to that. Transportation, given the current school schedule and the routing, they say that we're doing a reasonable, efficient job. Technology, right now, they see the human resource software seems appropriate, adequate. We use Google Apps, School Brain, Spice Works for our maintenance reporting. Food service, commended for the ability to do the productive rates that we have. These are all quotes from the audit, by the way. The district has a budget process that works really well, and that is basically um, dedication of our own administration staff. Now, with every audit, you know, we were looking for, show us where we can do efficiencies, because no matter how well you are doing, there should be some efficiencies somehow. And there will be pros and cons with those efficiencies. Facilities and maintenance, some of the pros and cons you'll see laid out here. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on each and every one, because we will have a public forum, probably our first week in November of the school committee meeting, a standard meeting. It will be a public forum where we'll talk about all the pros and cons. How, how much money it will save, how much it will cost to implement, and what we could possibly do with those tax dollars. So we're looking at outsourcing, custodial staff, largely that will help us in benefits, outsourcing outside work to Groton DPW. That would basically not simply mean that we would basically hire, technically, DPW through the town, and they would gray bill us, meaning we would pay an invoice like anyone else. Um, Custodia charge for all schools, we're looking at sharing resources, sharing management across the campuses that are close by. Building utilization, basically we're looking at moving our central office outside of Prescott where it is costing the district additional funds, allowing actually Prescott to utilize some other services for townspeople as well as possibly earning some profits to bring some tax money into town. We're looking at all district-owned buildings to do that. Um, we will be talking about this at our next meeting on October 25th at the high school if anyone wants to either tune in or attend. Um, again, the MSBA will play a big role for Florence Roach. And when they do look at that Florence Roach uh, rebuild renovation, they also, also look at every single district building, every school, because they're going to basically make sure that we can't push children in different areas before they go off and, and, and say they're going to help us reimburse for a whole new school or renovate a school. Transportation. So we want to get the ridership up to 75%. You need 75% uh, ridership for reimbursement of the state. Uh, you're going to be seeing some changes in the high school bus routes now. Um, that is to try and do our best to bring up that ridership. Um, You'll see future changes in regards to combining stops, combining, combining bus routes. Um, we will discuss in our forums charging bus fees. Um, anyone who takes a bus within a um, mile and a half from school, other districts do charge because they are not le legally um, obligated to provide busing if you live within a mile and a half of school. Again, discussions will take place. This is all in regards to obtaining savings, finding resources within our own budget, and assigning uh, ridership. Food service, again, um, discussions on outsourcing is going to have to take place. Uh, raising lunch prices, 
developing strategies to increase participation. If we can increase participation, then we can actually turn the deficit of the food service into a positive. So now that I've gone through the, the basically touched upon the um, audit, what I'd also like to know is at, at the, well, explain is at the end of the, um, well, in spring of town meeting, we told you about our goals and we had a lengthier process because we told you about what they all were and, and where we are. We've set our goals. Um, as I said, we started the ground running. We had basically four, four main goals, and you can see them above. Community outreach and communication, student performance, research infrastructure, educational environment. These goals are much more lengthy and more detailed than what you see here. Three minutes is not gonna kick it. So it is on the website, you can check it out there. To touch base, within seven weeks that we've been in school, um, we've been working for you. And the school committee liaisons, we've been attending town board meetings. We've organized joint meetings with other boards, from the Board of Selectmen, FinCom, in both towns. Um, Florence Roach, and, and it doesn't stop with just the school committee. We've been doing a lot of things. Our schools, you should be very proud of our schools. Florence Roach adopted um, a school in Houston to help them through the Hurricane Harvey. We have our high school that is doing two new trips that I'm really excited about. And, and what they are, and I'll touch upon them very briefly, is Give the Kids a World a Village that's in Kissimmee, Florida, and Camp Sunshine, which is in Maine. These are camps that are de de dedicated to helping children that have um, illnesses uh, uh, that of, of such magnitude that they're not, they're not sure where they're going to go. Specifically, Sunshine's camp is for little children that have cancer. So our, our students are going to be volunteering at many different levels, um, whether it be just delivering them a pizza and kissing me on site, and they're going to be camp, camp counselors. It's going to be a fantastic learning trip, a trip that they will never actually be able to forget. They'll, they'll definitely remember this, and it, they will grow immensely from those. So I'm very excited about those. We've had some pro programs with our seniors and students interacting together, which is uh, I'm really excited about that. I think that, I think that the seniors and, and students have a lot to offer, a lot of attributes, and when, you, when they do spend that time together, there is so much to be learned. So th there's been some things, and I did write them down so I wouldn't be totally gone with it. The middle school, we have a play, several plays every year. We have Little Mermaid. Some of the seniors are going to be helping our, uh, so when your children comes home from practicing the little play, they'll be actually rehearsing their roles with some seniors. Um, we basically had high school students that will be writing biographies of some of our seniors. Some fantastic stories are in our, com our, our own community and we'll be able to read them. It'll be fantastic. Um, elementary school students are having pen pals with seniors as well. So that's another thing that's going on. PTA, uh, which is great, and is having what they call a trunk for treats. And the COA will actually be there with their truck, dressed up, giving out candy with all the other parents and stuff for the kids at Halloween, which is great. We'll be having a spaghetti dinner in regards to inviting the seniors. And um, we are working right now and trying to coordinate with uh, Kathy Shelp in regards to the COA having a senior artist. This town is so rich with culture and talent, and we're starting to integrate that into the schools and back out to the seniors. So that basically some of the things that we're doing for the community outreach. Student performance, um, we're actually some of the newer things within, again, seven weeks. We have a maker space that's been started at the elementary level. Um, this is fantastic. It, com it combines computer skills, library skills, STEM pro projects. We've done the iReady, which for math and ELA, for K through, I believe, six is done already. This actually will help us with the change of MCAST. It seems like every time we turn around, there's a different MCAS test or not, you know, or parks. So it's very hard to compare or to help our kids grow and see where they are and where they want to get to. So this will help us do that. Resources infrastructure. Obviously, we've already touched upon the audit. We're also going to be reporting to you at our meetings, and it will be on our website, monthly reports of the capital and technology plan items. As we knock things off, you'll see them get taken care of. You'll see the way your tax money is being spent, your return of investment. Software currently being used in maintenance department, work orders, prevention, all of this is actually going to be coming on an upcoming school committee on October 25th. So if anyone is interested in hearing that, please come down. 
again, we're going to have the public forums, but also on the 25th, we're going to be talking about um, some of the implementing, possible implementing, um, some of the action items that came from this audit. And that is it, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>
If at any time during the meeting you are confused about procedure or have a question, you need simply state point of order and proceed to the nearest microphone. And I will recognize you to give me your point of order. It should be a question about procedure, if you think a rule is being broken, if you think the chair hasn't done something correctly, just say point of order. All voters should have received a yellow card when they came in. Everybody got their yellow card. This is very important. Do not lose it. This identifies you for the rest of this meeting as a voter entitled to vote at this meeting. Somebody lose a yellow card? Good, you found it, good. It'll be necessary to show this card in the event uh, of a hand count. The Warren has 19 articles on it tonight. We should be able to finish it tonight, but we don't have to. It's up to you. <laughs> Voters can assist the chair in finishing tonight by keeping the remarks succinct and on point and by avoiding repeated, repeating comments that have already been made. In the event a second night is needed, this space is reserved for one week from tonight. The chair has determined the warrant has been duly posted and will entertain a motion to waive a reading of the warrant. It has been moved and seconded that we waive the reading of the warrant. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The reading of the warrant is waived. Prior to the meeting, the chair was rec received a request from a voter to make a procedural motion. The chair recognizes Ms. Collette for this purpose. Mr. Moderator, my name is Michelle Collette. I live at 43 Windmill Hill. Uh, I move that debate during this town meeting be limited to three minutes for each speaker, with the exception of the main proponent and opponent of each article and at the discretion of the moderator. A motion has been made to limit debate. Is there a second? A motion has been moved and seconded to delimit for this town meeting debate to three minutes for each speaker with the exception of the main proponent and opponent of each article and at the discretion of the moderator. A motion to limit debate may not be debated. <laughs> A yes vote on the motion to limit debate will limit each voter to three minutes at the microphone. A no vote will set no limit. If passed and there is a time limit, Mr. Cataldo, our building inspector, will serve as the timekeeper. He will raise the yellow flag after two minutes and the red flag after three minutes, at which point you should wrap up your comments. Because it restricts speech, a motion to limit debate requires a two-thirds majority. Those in favor of the motion to limit debate signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. The ayes have it. The motion carries by a two-thirds majority. We are now under a three-minute limit. We now move to Article 1, a citizen's petition, Mr. Sabal. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move to see if the town will vote to change the wording of the markers approved at the 2017 Springtown meeting from all are welcome to welcome, such that the existing and any subsequent markers to be placed pursuant to that meeting will be read by line, Town of Groton, welcome, town meeting 2017. All funds needed to change the wording of the existing markers will be contributed by individual town citizens who wish to avoid divisiveness caused by the existing and planned markers. Article one has been moved and seconded. We have a panel of presenters beginning with Mr. Sabal. The welcome marker article seeks to assure that the town's public signage 
is politically and culturally neutral. Subsequent to the approval of the All Are Welcome markers, many town residents have learned that the wording of the signs does in fact have specific political and cultural connotations. This is not appropriate for a town with diverse citizens and points of view. The changes are sought to lessen the partisan divisiveness caused by town markers, which make a political, cultural statement rather than simply welcoming people of all backgrounds and views to our town. Good evening, my name is Jack Sabal. As a matter of introduction, I would like to state that I am a lifelong resident of Groton. I served four years in the U.S. Army, including a one-year tour of duty in Vietnam. I was an officer of the Groton Police Department for 30 years and retired as captain. And following retirement, I served two terms on the Board of Selectmen. We are presenting this article tonight because as mentioned in the summary, we believe firmly that a permanent marker that greets our neighbors and visitors needs to be one that is politically neutral and simple. This article, Article 1, has had much exposure and has been discussed by many more people and indeed in many more forums than the one that was presented at our Springtown meeting. Tonight, we come to this meeting as neighbors with an opportunity to hear or be heard on the merits of the article that I just read. We will leave this meeting with the issue decided and we will still be neighbors. There will be no celebration of winning or feelings of rejection for defeat. But instead, there will be a feeling of accomplishment that this issue which frankly has caused anxiety and division, has finally been properly debated and decided. And the town we know as Groton will, be continu will continue to be a welcoming community it always has been. Almost six months have passed since the introduction of the All Are Welcome article at the Springtown meeting. And during that period of time, many people with concerns and questions regarding that article have come forward publicly. At our Springtown meeting, Article 17 All Are Welcome was introduced by defining what it was not, rather than what it was. The presenter stated that it was not intended as a political statement, and that it was not intended to imply approval for sanctuary city status. But precisely because of those denials of the political nature of the Stones project, Article 17 was received by many with confusion. Following that town meeting, we expressed our concerns as to whether the article had received the proper debate that it deserved. Our concerns were lessened when we learned from the town meeting moderator that all our welcome article was advisory in nature and that the Board of Selectmen did actually have three options. Those options were that they could vote to sustain the article. They could vote to change the wording. They could vote to take no action and simply let it die. We had hoped to take a future opportunity for discussion and debate. But instead, what we encountered was out, outright rejection. We asked to meet one-on-one -on -one with the selectmen to discuss the option of changing the wording. Their response that a simple welcome did not have the same meaning and that they had no interest in discussing it further. We made a second request that when the board was considering their three options for the All Are Welcome article, that they hold their discussion at a public meeting. Their answer? was that they did not intend to hold a public meeting on that article. Only after we made that request publicly at the selectmen's meeting did they finally agree to schedule a public discussion for the All Are Welcome article. On June 5th, that hearing, when that hearing was held, the chair opened the meeting with a pronouncement 
that the selectmen could not take a vote that was contrary to the town meeting vote. This statement was in direct contradiction with the fact that it was indeed an advisory article. The board did present a slideshow which included wording from the US Constitution and the Statue of Liberty. And in their closing remarks, one selectman made the following statement, I'll quote it. Tolerance is what we all need to learn. If you can't look at your neighbor, or you can't look at somebody coming over the town line and say all are welcome to Ben, then there's something wrong with you, unquote. Questions remain as to whether the stone marker project was or is political. The answer can be found, I think, with the public actions that I have just outlined and by other actions taken by the board prior to the May town meeting. In March, at the same time, the stone marker project idea was moving towards inclusion in the warrant there was a discussion by the Board of Selectmen to sponsor a town meeting article which would direct the Groton Police Department not to follow the presidential order against sanctuary cities, essentially not to enforce the laws against illegal immigration. This article, Article 22, was pulled from the warrant at the last minute because of its perceived political consequences for the town. And finally, there's the question of the time capsules that were buried beneath each of those stones. There was no mention of time capsules in Article 17 when it was presented, and we did not vote on them. And that action clearly goes far beyond the purpose of a simple welcome message. Tonight, we ask you to consider all the facts and to support Article 1 for our town markers to read, Town of Groton, welcome. Town meeting, 2017. Respectfully, Jack Sable. And I would like to introduce now fellow petitioner, John Niles. John? Thanks, Jack. Good evening. My name is John Niles. I live on McLean's Woods Road here in Groton. My colleagues and I appreciate the chance to extend the discussion and revisit the wisdom of the All Are Welcome markers. And tonight, we hope also to bring important context to Article 17, information never expressed before its approval last spring. First, some definition. Article 1 is not an attempt to reverse the vote which last spring approved the welcome markers at the outskirts of town. Article 1 is a citizen's petition, a lawful and prescribed means by which we as citizens of Groton can bring to the attention of the selectmen and the town a concern, a request for consideration, or an accommodation. Second. Notwithstanding what you may have heard or read in recent days and the weeks leading up to tonight's town meeting, Article 1 was not developed by individuals fearful of diversity or somehow biased or bigoted. We are simply citizens who pay attention to our town government and tonight we seek to improve upon its governance. Further, we must respectfully disagree with those who originated the idea for the markers, who admit their own struggle with the growing divisiveness in our country, move them to approach their fellow selectmen with the thought that there must be a way for the town to express its hope that these national divides would resolve themselves for the good. As petitioners, we ask, why use the town in this way? Why should the town, a political entity that elects its own leaders with less than 23% voter participation, why should Groton, as sleepy as it is politically, raise its voice in a symbolic effort to resolve perceived national divides? Our town selectmen 
are elected without identifying their party affiliation for a reason. We prefer and assume our selectmen not act in a partisan manner during their term in office. So the substance in tonight's Article 1 upholds the vote approving welcome markers. However, as petitioners, we do seek a change to the wording carried on the markers for the following important reason. The words themselves have been co-opted by political activists and can be understood as aligning Groton with their agendas regarding immigration, refugees, and other social issues. Hang on, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the time limit does not apply to the primary proponents and primary opponents of an article. They are, have arranged longer presentations for the benefit of the meeting, and the chair will allow them to continue. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Quiet, please. Quiet. Quiet, please. We have a quick there's Google. There's four of them. We'll get through them a lot faster if you let them go. Thank you. A quick Google search reveals the words used on the markers are already, already widely used as a virtue signal our town neither created nor effectively endorsed. All Are Welcome is, in fact, the title of a national internet nonprofit with its own website. Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. Its first Facebook entry is dated November 15th, 2016, seven days after our national election, and some eight months before our town markers were approved, with a whopping 2% of town voter supporting the measure. So although the words, all are welcome, purport to show our courteous and inclusive town spirit, the words are also and unmistakably a current political slogan used by those of a particular political persuasion addressing national policy positions. As petitioners, we see the diversity of thought around our national issues as a sign of the freedom and liberty we enjoy within Groton. And we do not think our town should be perceived as aligning with any particular political party or activist organization. As petitioners, it is our wish to support the ideals of tolerance and inclusion personally, one by one, in our actions and in our lives, and not preach this fact to commuters and visitors and our fellow citizens through the messaging on a marker. We ask for your support of Article 1 so the wording on the markers can be changed to a simple, genuine welcome. Thank you, and I'd like to introduce Penny Homeyer. Thank you, John. Uh, first of all, it's wonderful to see a full auditorium this time around. Thanks for coming. My name is Penny Homeyer. My husband and I have lived at 18 Blossom Lane for more than 16 years. To save time at this meeting, we thought it appropriate to address several questions that have been posed to us as petitioners these last few months, and some that we anticipate will be raised this evening. Question one, why not just word the article so as to remove the markers? That was considered, but we decided against it for two reasons. First, donors contributed private funds, and the town committed substantial resources to the markers. It would seem a waste to discard them. But because they were purportedly placed as a welcoming gesture and to lessen divisiveness in our town, they should be worded to avoid partisan political issues that have polarized our country over the past several years. We believe they should be politically neutral, limited to a simple and genuine welcome. Second, we wanted to address our concerns in the least disruptive or contentious way. And we felt that demanding removal of the markers would send the wrong message to those who proposed and donated to the markers and more importantly, to the public at large. Question two. Won't changing the markers damage Groton's reputation as a friendly, welcoming town? That is exactly why we propose to change the wording on the markers rather than remove them. If Article One passes, its effect on the town's reputation will depend on how the change is presented and by whom. 
the responsibility for any negative perception of the town caused by this controversy unfortunately rests with the selectmen who chose to sponsor what they knew or should have known was a politicized message, mischaracterized those who disagreed with them, and ultimately concluded that those who objected to the all are welcome wording had something wrong with them. Article 1 envisions nothing but a welcoming message. We choose to welcome people to our town rather than create the impression that the town stands in solidarity with organizations who use the phrase all are welcome as a slogan for various divisive, polarizing political issues. Question three, do we believe as petitioners that criminals will enter our town because of markers which announce all are welcome? Absolutely not. This was an observation by some intended to demonstrate the foolishness of a literal interpretation of the markers. No one wants to invite criminals to a town. No one serious believes that the markers would encourage criminals to flock to our town. But this concept was nevertheless seized upon by those who support the all are welcome markers to belittle and mock opponents of the markers. This was one of the selectmen's opening assertions in introducing Article 17 when he instructed us as to what article supposedly was not. Question four, why were time capsules buried beneath the markers when Article 17 made no mention of them? We don't know why that decision was made or who made it. We note that time capsules were not mentioned in Article 17, were not authorized by the vote on that article at town meeting. According to reporting in the Herald, the contents of the, excuse me, according to reporting in the Herald, the contents of the capsules included a statement about political polarization in the country and the controversy surrounding the markers in Groton, essays by school children on the meaning of all are welcome, and copies of the Herald where the controversy was described. We don't know if this is complete or what else might be in them, but this is surely another example confirming the political nature of the message on the markers. I would now like to introduce John Valentine. John? Thank you, Penny. Um, I will continue with four more Q&As. Uh, question five. Do the petitioners have the ability to raise the funds necessary to make the changes to the markers? Yes, uh, we have uh, obtained bids of uh, approximately $150 per marker to change them in place. We have pledges for the necessary amounts to proceed, but would welcome contributions from others committed to removing the cause for the divisiveness in our town. We do not ask the town to bear any expense, not even $1. Uh, question six, if Article 1 passes, should those who donated the markers be reimbursed or should the markers be returned to them? Answer, Article 1 does not address this issue. However, it is our view that if the donors truly wanted to lessen divisiveness in our town and nation, and if all are welcome was not intended to signal support for any political cause, then they should welcome the opportunity to change it to non-controversial language. But if they insist upon the precise words, all are welcome, knowing, at least now, that those words are understood to demonstrate solidarity with the Sanctuary City movement and other causes, and also knowing at the time that the <clears throat> donations were made that a challenge to Article 17 was then in place. We see no reason to reimburse them. If the markers, however, are ever to be returned to the donors, we would believe that the, the words town, of, um, uh, town meeting 2017 should be removed. Question seven, why didn't the people opposed to all our welcome markers speak out in the spring? There's several reasons. First, there was no organized opposition. People did not take Article 17 seriously. Many simply assumed that their fellow townspeople would reflexively oppose having politically charged signs at their borders. Second, many may have taken our selectman at his word that the signs had nothing to do with illegal immigrants, the sanctuary city movement, <clears throat> or other divisive political issues, and that they were just intended as a welcoming measure. Who would disagree with that sentiment? In the abstract, we actually all agree that all are and should be welcome to our town, whether we agree with their politics or not. 
if you don't know that, if you didn't know that familiar and welcoming phrase had been co-opted by the sanctuary city movement and other political causes, there would be little opposition, little reason to oppose it. And I might add that had that slogan been, you know, a, a right-wing slogan, had it been associated with some other cause, we in this group, I think, to a man would, and woman would, <laughs> would really oppose it with equal vigor because it is not appropriate to have political slogans and greetings at our town. Um, <clears throat> Third, some people were undoubtedly confused and thought they were only authorizing a symbolic $1 of town funds, so why oppose it? Just move along. Fourth, and most importantly, we believe that many people simply were very reluctant to speak up after the selectman's emotional introduction for fear that they could be branded as haters and bigots if they disagreed with using the selectman's catchphrase or, the cha or challenged his motive after he so emphatically insisted that all are welcome was only a welcoming gesture. I know I was. Being a relative newcomer to the town, my wife tapped me on the shoulder and said, Let, don't, don't speak, you know, keep your t hold your tongue. You know, and, and so I think others felt likewise, and the, there was no dialogue that began. As presented, many people simply did not feel p comfortable in publicly questioning Article 17. It is for this reason that we as petitioners will move at the end of our presentation for a secret ballot on Article 1. We know for a fact that many people feel intimidated and are reluctant to publicly support a simple welcome on our town's new markers. They would go along to get along with their friends and neighbors who may, uh, who may support the All Are Welcome movement. They want to avoid being branded as someone who, in the words of one of your selectmen, quote, has something wrong with them, unquote. In such a poisoned atmosphere and with such strident intolerance for diversity of opinion, a secret ballot is necessary. Last question. Do petitioners agree with town council's interpretation of Article 1 uh, reported in the Herald as being advisory? Absolutely not. In answering this question, I'll speak not only as a presenter, but as an attorney with 43 years experience. While it may generally be the case that only articles involving a bond issue or, or requiring a vote uh, will require, <clears throat> you know, are deemed mandatory, Article 1 should not fall under that general rule or be viewed by the board in any, in any event as being advisory. First, our article was, uh, was altered by someone who printed it who, uh, before it was printed in the warrant. It was changed to include the following words, quote, or to take any other action relative thereto, end quote. You'll see those words in the, in the warrant. They were not up here on the screen. <clears throat> the elimination of these words eliminates at least one basis for the exercise of any discretion by the Board of Selectmen or our town manager. Article 1 was not and is not intended to merely advise a change in the wording to the very group which proposed using politically charged language in the first place. It is intended to mandate a change. Second, the Board does not have authority uh, does not have to authorize any funds or work by the town employees or the use of town equipment in connection with this article. In fact, the board need not take any action. Under this article, the mandate of the town voters could be implemented directly by petitioners who are effectively authorized to engage a stone working company at no cost to the town to proceed with changing the words on the markers. If you sustain Article 1 tonight, whether advisory or not, we would expect the town selectmen and hope that the town selectmen would graciously acknowledge the divisiveness which the present wording has caused and act to heal the wounds which were opened by Article 17 so that we just might lay our individual political differences aside and be good neighbors and friends who by our natures welcome all to our town. We ask each and every one of you whether making a political statement to those entering our town is really worth the ill feelings and mean insults it has engendered over the past six months, please vote to sustain Article 1. I now give you Don Black, who will conclude our presentation. Uh, before Mr. Black speaks, 
Before, before Mr. Black speaks, the chair would like to clarify one thing. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it gets a little arcane in town meetings, uh, but there is a significant difference between an article and a motion. An article that is printed in the warrant sets the parameters for what we can discuss at the meeting. However, an article itself is not acted on. We need a motion to act on. That motion is what's printed on the screen. It does not include the words or take any other action relative thereto, which is generally tacked onto articles. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. So what you see on the screen is what you will be voting, voting on unless you choose to amend it. Mr. Black. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> In February of 1963, I was 12 years old and in Broughton Junior High School, a building that is known today as Prescott School. I'd returned back to school from a basketball game out of town. It was late in the evening, it was dark out, and the instructions from my mother that day were to, upon my arrival back at school, simply walk to Dixon's Drug Store, which is the current Murphy Insurance Company, and on the wall there was a public phone, not a pay phone, but a public phone. And if you were to make a local call, you had free use of it. I went down to the drugstore. I picked up the phone. I called my mother. She said, your father will be right along to pick you up. A little while later, he showed up, sat down to have a cup of coffee with a couple of his friends that were at the counter. And he said to me, why don't you go over to the newsstand right over there and get the Lowell Sun, today's Lowell Sun. As I approached the newsstand, in the second entry door came three well-dressed black men. The shortest of the three came up to me and said, excuse me, can you tell me how to get to Groton School? Upon receiving my directions, he said, thank you. And I said to him, you're welcome. With that, he extended his hand, we shook, and he said, I cannot tell you how gratified I am to hear those words. After they left, Mr. Dixon, the owner, asked me if I knew who I just shook hands with. I told him I did not. He said, that was Martin Luther King, and he is speaking at Groton School this evening. Since that day 54 years ago, I have often wondered what kind of courage it took for Dr. King to enter that drugstore that evening. But on that night, he was simply a man seeking directions, and every Groton citizen in that store would have obliged him. In my long duration here, I've known Groton to be nothing but a welcoming community. The art or sign of welcome was ingrained in us by our parents and their parents in them. I remember in grade school, children of military families from Fort Devens were constantly becoming our classmates, and we accepted and welcomed them as if they were born and grown up here in Groton. But I fear the art of welcome went a step too far in our vote on Article 17 in the Springtown meeting. I do not for a second, I do not for a second fear the word welcome. In fact, I embrace it. I think we all embrace it. But I do fear the words all are. The word all can mean everything and everyone. And there are a few everythings and everyones that you and I would not wish to welcome to town. I believe for the sake of our future and our children's and grandchildren's future, we must be most careful in our custodial duties. Through the placement of those markers, we became negligent of such. In 1869, President Ulysses Grant came to Groton and spent a few days here. He arrived by train. There was a huge reception to receive him. And it is said during the days he was here, he shook the hand of every man, woman, and child in town. If we fast forward to the present time, 148 years later, I wonder what would happen if our current president were to come to Groton today. If I am to believe all that I read in social media, the reception would be less than welcoming. And based on recent vandalism to private property, I wonder about that even more. It should make you stand 
and when you stand, take notice. For if you have the slightest question in your mind, we must change the wording on the stones, for truly we were becoming disingenuous to ourselves as well as to others. And if you even have the slightest reservation about who you would welcome and who, who you would not, then you have to say to yourself, all are not welcome. And the wording on the stones must be changed to Town of Groton, Welcome, Town Meeting, 2017. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Blunt. Uh, Mr. Moderator, that concludes our presentation, but uh, before I leave, I would uh, move that when we vote on the main motion, we do so by secret ballot. Is there a second? A motion has been made and seconded to vote by secret ballot when the, mood, when the meeting votes on the main motion. A motion to fix the method of voting may be debated. The chair will allow debate on both the main motion and the method of voting. When it comes time to vote on the main motion, we will first vote whether conduct, conduct a secret ballot. After that vote, we will vote on the main motion accordingly. Are there any official town committee reports on this article? I see Miss. oh, I'm sorry. Hang on, Mr. Eason, I jumped ahead. We do have uh, opposing viewpoints tonight by the selectmen. First, uh, Ms. Minugian. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. As a community and as a board, in many open public meetings, we have already spent a tremendous amount of time and effort in debating this topic. A majority of town meeting voters approved the stones as they have been installed. The majority of the Board of Selectmen have voted not to support this article. It is time to move away from this debate and focus on larger issues facing our community. A no vote on this article will uphold the vote of the last town meeting and leave the stones as they have been installed. We urge you to join the majority of the Board of Selectmen and vote no on this article, thereby affirming that indeed all are welcome. And Mr. Petropoulos. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The fact that we're here is shocking and saddening to me. It challenges. Point of order. Yes, sir. I believe he's speaking in his capacity as a selectman. So That's he's correct. entitled to the center stage microphone. It's shocking and saddening to me because it challenges the assumptions that I held when I proposed this project to our police chief our former librarian director, our superintendent of schools, and our town manager, and carried their endorsement through to the Board of Selectmen, who also enthusiastically endorsed this project and brought it to town meeting. It seems so simple then. We couldn't even imagine an objective or an objection, probably because we didn't see it the way it's been represented here. We saw it as a simple, honest message. I've learned that I was naive. I was honest, I was sincere, I was unaffiliated, but naive. I was naive about the fears that this would inflame and the extent to which some would go to address those fears. Two elected officials have been accused of serious transgressions, including denial of freedom of speech, dishonesty, collusion, to defend against these things is to give validity to their premise, and I have neither the heart nor the inclination to do so. But no one should suffer such allegations. As a selectman, I accept that I'm responsible for decisions with which people will sometimes disagree, and that for some, disagreement will become ugly. I expect to have to endure that burden, but our moderator is asked only to be allowed to facilitate our modest democracy 
No honest analysis of the performance in the last town meeting would ever suggest that he's done otherwise. As for the remaining allegations, I cannot, <clears throat> I cannot help what you're willing to believe. I just ask you to consider them carefully. This has been a very unpleasant few weeks. Those of you that have followed this know that. But it's taught me quite a few things, not the least of which is that I should not mistake naivete for misguidedness. I see these stones today and the message they carry as more important than ever. And that's why this vote is important. This message on these stones and its fate for which we are responsible this evening will do more than just define our small community. It will define our contribution to the world in which we play a small but important role. This is a good, honest, humble, harmless message. It is affiliated with nothing, nothing other than our imaginations and our preconceived ideas. If we imagine it to be something good, it will serve that purpose for as long as the stones endure. If we imagine it to represent our demons, we can wipe off the words, but the demons will always be there, no matter how deeply we blast the stone. To, th to those who see this as something evil, and see something evil in this message, I'm asking you tonight to have the courage to walk by these stones and find a way to lose whatever, whatever demons they may represent to you. Live with these stones and their simple message. These stones and this message will not harm you. But even if you can't bring yourself to take that step, know that what we do tonight, the fate we cast for this simple message, will tell us and all those who come to hear about our vote who we are. Don't let this town be defined as the town that removed all from the symbol of our town. It will leave a scar that will define and divide us forever. Thank you. It is now time, time for committee reports. I believe Mr. Isom with the Sustainability Commission. Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you very much. On Tuesday, the Sustainability Commission voted with two in favor, one against, and one abstention to not recommend Article One to the voters of town meeting. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Over here. Not related to what he just said. That's fine. The floor is now open, yeah? So, yes, I have a question. Um, it's about the time capsules. When we voted on the stone markers and I was here, um, was anything said about time capsules being put underneath the stone markers that, like, did we know about that when we voted on having stone markers? Uh, Mr. Petropoulos? The time capsules were initially uh, discussed, and discussed actually in public at Board of Selectmen's meeting. Um, they were discussed with the superintendent of schools and intended to be a capsule into which the school essays were to be placed. The uh, issue of the students providing those essays, and, and they were originally supposed to present them here at town meeting, which again, to, due to my naivete, became a hot button political issue and they were asked not to present these things. And so because the students were not to present these at town meeting, the time capsules were not discussed at town meeting. Over time, the idea of placing additional information into the time capsules was discussed, and we determined to do so. That information contained uh, newspaper articles from the Herald, letters to the editor to the Herald, both for and against, uh, essays by funders, and an invitation was sent out to the, the movers of Article One to place an essay into the time capsule describing their opposition to the stone. That opposition, or that invitation was declined, but it was an effort to provide for the future an objective view of what this stone meant and why it was placed. Thank you. So I wasn't talking about the stone, I was talking about the capsules that were put underneath. Uh, should, these, should this have been voted on at town meeting that we as the town 
are putting something for our next generation to read underneath that was not re representative of the whole town. You may make that suggestion if you like. I did not bring it up. It was discussed. Quiet, please. It was discussed in public at selectmen's meetings. In the back, yes, ma'am. Yes, um, I'm Berta Erickson. Um, I was going to give my original address, but it's now 2A Long Cope. And boy, am I trying to cope. But anyway, from my point of view, this controversy has arisen out of the lack of proper process. The Board of Selectmen should not be dealing with national issues, i.e. the introduction, introduction to Groton being a sanctuary city. And this itch, issue, which emanated from uh, um, our national immigration policy discussion. In my nearly 48 years living here, these types of issues were left up to the higher forms of government, and the Board of Selectmen is to deal with local issues and its local co constituents and not act as a bully pulpit. Originally, when this was presented to the town meeting, the proponent of the article stood on stage, acting as a member of the Board of Selectmen, when in reality his position should have been in the well, acting as a citizen since the article originated with him. There has been some controversy about the vote itself. Some felt it was brushed and was not given a fair airing, but that now is behind us and the vote was acted upon, but again, without proper process. The vote was to have the, the wording, all are welcome. That was the vote. There was no vote to include by town meeting vote on the, on the stones, and there was no vote to include time capsules to be buried under them. Who made those decisions and to what was, as to what was buried and what was said on the material that was buried? I thought from the get-go, and it is only my opinion that a handful of people donating for this procedure is not copacetic. This is a town-wide decision and should have been paid for by taxpayers' money as it has such public exposure. May I add parenthetically, the stones or the rocks or whatever you want to call them with a welcoming message should look welcoming. The, the ones that were chosen are dark and dreary written in small, smallish print, not visible from the road, and not very cheerful. The fact is, my, my estimation, they look like cemetery markers. <laughs> a, light, a, lighter, a, 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 a lighter colored granite with a big, bold welcome would have delivered a, a much brighter message. I know that some of this is Monday morning quarterbacking, but this whole debacle was built on a faulty uh, foundation to begin with, i.e. the Board of Selectmen acting in a very inappropriate, in, inappropriately for their position. Oftentimes, shaking foundations, shake, oftentimes shaky foundations lead to shaky consequences, and that's what happened here. I would bet my life that, um, that there, are a few, there are very few people in, in, sitting here tonight that have not been welcoming to, to, to all our newcomers, or any, any newcomers we may come in touch with, and been, as a newcomer, welcomed. And we don't need a dirty old rock to convey that. <laughs> a actions actions Mrs. speak louder than words. Mrs. Erickson? Yes? We are under a three-minute time limit, and you I've got one, it. one more, uh, two, two sentences. Quickly. A may I, may I? Quickly, yes, quickly. Actions speak louder than words, and incidentally, I'm very much looking forward to the new temple in town and attending the services there and learning more about Hinduism. Mrs. Mrs. Holmeyer, you had a chance at the microphone earlier. Did you have a rebuttal to something that was stated? <clears throat> yes, please, just quickly on the... Uh... What is your point of order? So yes, yes, sir. Both motions are, both motions are on the floor. Debate is allowed on both at this time. Yes, ma'am. I just wish to briefly rebut um, Mr. Petropoulos' contention about the markers. Um, I did go back and view all of the selections meetings and read all of the minutes since January. I couldn't personally find anything about the markers, and that's one of the reasons why we brought it tonight. That's all. Mr. Petropoulos. 
time capsules. I, I read through all about the time capsules, not the markers. Obviously, much that the cost there. would be really in the engraving, and Sorry. we could fundraise for that pretty easily, I'm sure. Hang on, ladies and gentlemen, um, you're hearing a, a video. We would bury underneath it. these stones the essays by these kids. These stones, because of their in fact, they're stones. They'd be permanent. They don't need to be big, bold, flashy signs. They, in fact, could be subtle. It would really just be a permanent demarcation, non-religious, non-political, that when you come to our town, you're welcome to be in our town. Um, and uh, this seems to get some, some reasonable reviews. And I guess I'd like to put it before the Board of Selectmen to ask whether or not this is an idea we'd like to consider to adopt and put forward and ask our town to support. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, I like the idea. It actually, it actually in the back, yes, ma'am. My name is Betsy Reeves. I'm a lifelong member of the town of Groton, and for 33 years, a member of the Groton Fire Department, and that is how I serve my town. At, when I first read this motion, um, the discussion on it, I thought it was all semantics. I thought it was just words, as I'm sure that many people in this room thought as well. However, I do not like to be an uninformed voter, so I made the effort to find out about what all of the change on the wording means. And I think had this been brought forward 100 years ago, it might not have been an issue at all because 100 years ago, politics didn't move anywhere near as fast as they're moving today, and they're moving way too fast. I can't keep up with it even though I watch the news every morning and I was uninformed. Now I'm better informed, and this is a highly political statement. It is what is happening in our country today, and I think it's important that the sleepy little town of Groton, Massachusetts not get involved in the politics in the world today. I would ask all citizens to please vote yes to the motion that's on the floor today. I think that um, the suggestion that Groton is a sanctuary town is not what, something that we should be doing. And if we just watch that, that video of Selectman Petropolis saying this is not a political thing, he was even less informed than I was. I'm now much more informed. Thank you. The chair will endeavor to call on voters to speak as he saw them rise down front. Sir? Yes, sir, down front. Good evening, folks. So, I make a habit of trying to be involved in our town politics and I show up to our town hall meetings and I sit here in the front and I speak my mind and I want to share with you guys my experience from the last town meeting when this was voted on and whatnot. I was privy to conversations that happened right here, right at the end of the town meeting. And I think it's important for us to understand that the fact that this was a definitive political message was openly discussed by members of our town council, member employees of the town, prominent members of the town, right here. It was an openly discussed secret that this was a political message. And I find myself in a conundrum because I actually support the message. You know, my, mo my mother's an immigrant. Both of her parents are immigrants. They came to this country as refugees from World War II. I support the message. I don't support town motions and articles being put forth in a disingenuous manner. And maybe certain members of our board were naive to the connotations, and I certainly hope that's true. But I can say definitively that there were plenty of other people, some of which are in this room right now, that were preying upon your naivety, if that is in case how it was. And that's truly unfortunate. But it was openly discussed by prominent members of our town right here. Oh, it was the consolation prize for not passing the sanctuary city stuff. That's a quote. I think there's somebody right here that said those exact words, and I'm not gonna point them out. But our democratic process demands honesty, and having somebody come to this microphone right here and propose a motion for you to vote on while lying to you 
is ridiculous. And, and if we could, I would, I would propose sanctions of various sorts. Because there's no doubt that it was a political message. And I find myself torn so horribly internally because I, I want to welcome everybody to this town. And I think it is the appropriate message. But, but for somebody to stand right here and lie, I'm not going to mince my words. I'm not going to be quite so kind as you were, quite frankly. You were lied to, period. And you should all think about that. In the back, yes, ma'am. Hi, Marlena Gilbert, 45 Arbor Way. First of all, I want to apologize because I was not at the town meeting when the markets were passed. And so I, I, I appreciate it actually coming back for discussion because I can say what I was not here to say that night. The schools, the school district, the school committee, none of them knew about these markers at all until our children got an email from principals inviting our children to write essays for a marker that we all soon discovered was going to be on a warrant article. The first thing that I thought was I, I was infuriated because I felt as a parent that my child was being used to sell something to town meeting. And I, I did not appreciate that. I discussed it. I thought about it. I went as a school committee member to the Board of Selectmen meeting. I did address the board as a school committee member, not as a chair and not as speaking on behalf of the whole school committee. But I made it very clear that evening, and perhaps we may have a video of it, I'm not sure, that the school committee did not recommend, endorse, or want any part in regards to these markers. Not because we were against all or welcome, not because we're against welcome, because the schools are not a political forum. They should never be, they should never be turned into it. And that is exactly why I went to board of selectmen meeting that evening. They were gracious enough to change the wording, which I truly appreciate, because it did separate our schools from politics. And that is just the information I want to share with you tonight. Down, down front, Mr. Winnegan. Mr. Winnegan, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Mike Manuki, and I live in on uh, Pepper Road in West Groton. Uh, I want to add one thing. I think it benefits everybody if we stay away from personal allegations and simply talk about the issues, because you can make allegations and you can swear that someone lied or didn't lie or was trying to trick you. But let's discuss this on the basis of what's good and bad about the markers and not what we suspect about various town officials or anybody else for that matter. I don't think it adds to the discussion. But I voted against these markers in the last town meeting and I voted against them because I feel that Groton is not a welcoming town. And I thought it was misrepresenting. <laughs> Sometimes I try to be funny, I didn't that time. But <laughs> I, I felt it was misrepresenting the town. Um, now, I've seen the, the markers spring up one by one, and uh, one of the things that happens is when we see something every day, we sort of get used to it, and we say, oh, that's normal, what, regardless of what it is. And, I, and, and some of the normal things are really nice, like the trees and the woods and the openness of Groton and all that sort of thing. And some of the normal things may not be so nice, but we're used to them. And I think in some ways that's how unconscious, I'll use the word bigotry, it might be a little too strong, bigotry grows because we see things we're used to and we think, that's all right, I've seen that for years, that's just, that's the way it is, it's the way it should be. Well, I like the markers. I think the fact that they say all are welcome might help us get used to that idea that all are welcome. I'm another one of those naive people who thinks there are three words, all are welcome. Could they be used by something else? They sure could. They're simple words. But I think if people see those every day, maybe that helps push us in the right direction. And also, it shouldn't end on a negative, but. I don't want to try to explain to my grandkids, you know, when they say grumpy, why did they take all our off the rocks? I don't know. I can't really explain it. In the back, 
Gracias, Juan. Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Safi. I live at 37 Bixby Hill Road in Groton. Um, first of all, I just wanted to take issue with the idea that some white markers might be a little bit more cheerful than the tannish brown ones that we have now marking the areas coming into town. Those tannish brown markers happen to be the same color as my children's skin, and I find them very cheerful. So, uh, second, second point. Um, you, the petition claims that uh, you're trying to make this politically and culturally neutral by changing it from all are welcome to just welcome. But I also know how to use Google. I am, after all, one of the few people who raise their hands for being under 40. And I, when you do Google welcoming, the first page, the bottom of the first page right there, the Clinton initiative from the Clinton Foundation, and it's welcoming, and it's about uh, immigration. So we might have to take welcome off as well if we're really trying to take out everything political and cultural here. And lastly, I want to speak directly to Mr. Petropoulos. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for starting this initiative. I haven't been very uh, locally, politically active at all. I have three small children. They're two, five, and seven, all boys. Everyone says, a handful, yes. Well, one day recently, a couple of months ago, my husband was with the five-year-old. They were in Lunenburg, and they were just walking out from an appointment, and somebody came by in their car and yells out the window, go back to your country. You know what? Those all are welcome signs that are around Rotten now have a whole new meaning to our family. When we see them, we get the exact feeling that I think you set out when you started this and you came to the Board of Selectmen and you said that you wanted to make sure that we stood up and said that hate won't be tolerated in Groton. So what's wrong with saying that hate won't be tolerated in Groton? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In the back, yes ma'am. My name is Terry Rago. I live on Indian Hill Road in Groton. Until the last proponent of Article I spoke, I was almost persuaded to the views of those who support Article, propose Article I. The views of the last speaker reinforce what I have heard to be a discriminatory plea being behind the removal of all R from the signs. Because he spoke about, we don't want certain people coming or something to that effect. And this isn't necessary in this age. I think that's un-American. Yes, sir. Good evening. I'm speaking as an individual and not as a selectman. However, I am going to reference Selectman Petropolis' comments when he first brought this forward approximately a year and a half to two years ago. All are welcome as a sign. I thought it made a lot of sense. We live in a very white town. Not a lot of diversity here. There's diversity coming to town, though, and more and more people are moving to town. Different races, different religions, it doesn't matter if you're white or black or yellow or brown or tan or purple. I could give a crap. It's all about who you are in your heart and what you have to say. And what you want to be able to do is welcome everybody. Make everybody feel good. It doesn't matter if you're straight or if you're gay or if you're upside down or if you stand on your head or if you have curly hair. What matters is, is that if you respect each other and you respect your neighbors, even if you don't agree with them, you have to agree to disagree. And it's not about a sanctuary city, because I pay my taxes, and I hope you all pay your taxes too. And I don't support illegal immigration, but that doesn't mean that you're not welcome. You're welcome to come here and get arrested or if you're illegal. I mean, sure you are. However, that's not how it works. You do something wrong, you're subject to arrest. All I want to see is everybody treated with fairness and equity, and I can look at you all and say, all are welcome, and I'll stand by that. Thank you. Down front, yes, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Peter Cunningham, 44 Smith Street. I just uh, would like to find out regarding the manner, or proposed manner of voting uh, from the town clerk, roughly uh, how long that would take or what the process would be involved uh, to do that, if that's possible. Thank you. Town clerk, Mike Bouchard. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was given a, an indication that there would be an, uh, a call for a secret ballot, so we have prepared for that. You'll see some tables up front here. We'll have a voting machine. We have ballots that are generic yes, no ballots. You'll be voting on a question, should you decide as a meeting to vote by secret ballot? So if you make that decision, we will display the question that will be in front of you. There'll be a voting machine here. Our process, which will be explained again at the time, will be that everybody will be using their yellow card to come up to the front of the room, exchange that for a ballot, deposit your ballot, and get a new town meeting card of a different color. That's our rough process. The time frame, we have over 400 people there. Your guess is almost as good as mine. I'm thinking it's a half hour to 45 minutes. Thank you, sir. Was there some, is somebody over here waiting at this microphone? Are those folks against the wall? You've been there for a while. Yes, sir, go ahead. Uh, Richard Hewitt, Longley Road. First of all, I have a question, if I may, before I make my comments. Is that a, appropriate? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm still unclear. Um, when the selectmen held their meeting after the first town vote, the, the chairman, as I understood it, told the selectmen that their choice, that it was a mandatory uh, motion, that their only choice was to delay implementation. Now, I've heard that it was just advisory, so I'm confused on what made that advise, or made that uh, mandatory versus advisory, and what makes this mandatory advisory. I'm still unclear, and I'd like to hear from town council. Uh, our town council is Mr. David Dineski. We'll, we'll try with Mr. Petropoulos first, and then... You referred to Mr. Donaski, but Mr. So, Petropoulos. I, I think the question is, you'd like, you'd like some clarification on the, the initial discussion with regard to is, are the Board of Selectmen required or not to install those stones after the first time? No, vote? no, no, no. I'm asking the question. Chairman Deegan told the Selectmen when that meeting started, as I heard it, that it was a mandatory action required of them, that their only choice, the only thing they could do was delay it. I didn't hear anything about it being advisory that they could choose not to implement it. And I'm still confused as to which it was it, mandatory or advisory. And likewise, I'm confused about this question that's before us. Is it mandatory or is it advisory? All right, I'll answer the mandatory advisory piece and then I'll turn over to Mr. Deegan who can tell you what he said. This motion, like the previous motion, is a motion that allows or enables the item that is moved. So for Article 17, the item moved was to install these stones as described. Um, and we, and the Board of Selectmen were enabled to do that by a town meeting vote. In this article, but they were but not required to do it. Uh, in this article, the Board of Selectmen will be enabled to authorize removal of words from the stone and not required to do it. I I miss, I'm certain that Mr. Deegan's explanation was some form of explanation of that. I'll turn this over to him. But does that answer the enabled, uh, sorry, required and not required piece? Just to, uh, let me hear what Mr. Deegan okay. has to say. Mr. Deegan. As Jack explained, there was a dollar appropriation. I'm not sure if you said that with the spring town meeting article. And all the rest of the funds were to be raised by private donors. Town meeting made a vote. That vote is considered advisory, just like most votes, unless there is an appropriation associated with that. What I said is that we once did not listen to town meeting. I'm getting red flagged? No, Mr. Catala, hang on. There's been some back and forth, so we'll pause the clock for a little bit. Go ahead, Mr. Deegan. Thank you. 
So at any rate, what I said was, once before, the Board of Selectmen did not listen to a vote of town meeting, and I believe that had to do with the personnel board. And that created a tremendous amount of conflict when the selectmen did not follow the vote of a town meeting. And while it is not mandatory, I said it is very important to follow the vote of town meeting. That is what I said. What is your comment, Mr. Hewitt? Yeah, I guess I misunderstood the meeting uh, that, that I heard on television because I heard it differently. I think you should go back and listen to that. Any case, isn't it ironic that a sign ostensibly meant to bring people together has only divided people? Ironic, yes. Surprising, no. I have been pretty much a regular town meeting since moving here almost 40 years ago. One of the things I have come to appreciate most over the years is the town's ability to discuss and resolve often challenging issues with very little personal acrimony. This is, I believe, in large part to an unspoken but generally accepted social compact to keep national partisan politics out of town meeting. On rare occasions when someone got up and started on some partisan rant or other, they were quickly silenced with hisses and even boos. This tradition of social, this, the tradition of this social compact has served us well over the years. Unfortunately, this compact was broken when Selectman Petropolis chose to move the original stone marker motion at the Springtown meeting and thereby introduce partisan politics into the meeting. The resulting divisiveness was entirely predictable. When both sides accuse each other of politicizing the issue, it is, by definition, political. The controversial outcome, approval by less than 1% of registered voters in town, has led us to where we are today, revived revisiting the issue yet again. One selectman said in response to the expressed dissatisfaction of some residents that basically if voters didn't like the outcome, they had themselves to blame for not attending town meeting. I strongly disagree with this statement. Of course, there are many people who don't come and could, but there are also many people who have many reasons for not attending, chief among them child care, seniors who have trouble driving at night or sitting for hours, people who are out of town, ill, and a host of other reasons. It is not for us to judge them, and their vote should count too. How have we gotten to this point? Could it be that because the issue isn't really the issue? Does anyone truly believe potential visitors or residents really care or will decide to come or not based on whether the word all is implied on a sign or stated on a sign marker? For that matter, would they, does it even make any difference if there are any stone, stone markers? But this isn't really the issue. We all know this has become a surrogate for the present administration, and let's not pretend otherwise. I have no objection, to be clear, I have no objection to raising political issues such as this, but I do not believe town meeting is the proper place for them. We all know that the making such a controversial decision on the basis of a small percentage of voters is not how democracy is most supposed to work. Making a political statement that is supposed to reflect town sentiment to be truly representative requires much greater participation than just a little over 1% of voters. This can be easily achieved by placing such issues on a spring town ballot where many more citizens are able to and do participate. This is the only way to reach a consensus that will be accepted by the majority of citizens to truly represent our town. We need to get the poisonous Pandora of partisan politics back into the box and out of town meeting, at least we become as divided and dysfunctional as the jerks in Washington. In the back, yes ma'am. Okay. I heard a lot about this phrase being taken by the Sanctuary City Movement. I don't know much about the Sanctuary City Movement. I loved these markers. I loved all R. I thought it was a beautiful sentiment. And today I Googled it. I thought, how am I so behind? I'm really politically active. How can I have missed this secret buzzword? You know, the all are welcome. And so I Googled it. I'm over 40, but I can do it. Um, and what I got was two pages of Christian hymns and our town. Um, our town. So what is the little town of Groton, the sleepy town everybody calls it, doing up there on that page? Um, what was it doing up there on that page in the spring? If you Google Groton, you get a lot about Christian symbolism and you get a lot at the moment about inclusion. We were on NPR tonight, I don't know if you know about that. Uh, and tomorrow we're gonna be in all those media outlets 
saying whether or not we decided to sandblast all our off our welcome. Is that who this sleepy town is? Everybody has said tonight this is political. Well, you know what? I googled that too. And it says political has to do with governance, activities of governance. That's what we are. This is governance. This is us. This is our job tonight. People have said, oh, we want to do a secret ballot. We don't want to stand up. We're reserved. We're a legislative body. We propose motions. We do modifications to those motions, and we vote. We vote with our neighbors. And if we disagree with our neighbors, we talk to them later. That's what we're here for. We're here to do the best kind of politics. I don't want my view to be secret. I want you to know it. And if I don't agree with you, I want to talk about it so we can come and create the political and cultural feeling of our town. I don't want us to be politically and culturally neutral. I want us to be politically and culturally fantastic. A lot of... I've heard half a dozen people tonight say, let's not talk about national politics. Let's leave that to those people in Washington. I'm not leaving anything to the people in Washington. I want to do it right here, where I care and I know my neighbors, and I care about it. Yeah? The words all are are not harmful, harmless, little tiny words. They're powerful, fantastic words. And I want us to own them and live them and be with them. And I don't care if some other group took them too. I think they're great words. And I think I'm going to use them and keep them. And I'm going to stand up and say, I want this. Because, and I'll hold my card up. I don't need to take it as a secret. This is our legislative body. Let's use it. Over here, yes, sir. Peter Jeffrey, I've lived in Groton for 20 years. I'm really, as, as many others have said, I'm really amazed at the division these two simple words have caused in our community. It has caused me to ponder why anyone would feel the words all are welcome have some divisive purpose. I've come to the conclusion that muting that phrase is the real divisive purpose. And we're real, are we ready to accept our caring community, a change that would liken our commitment to humanity to a phrase that's inscribed on a cheap doormat? I say no. Please take these statements as ironic examples of engravings I hope we would never agree were appropriate. Would we propose welcome only to those who look like us? Welcome to only those who think like us? By removing the words all are is the intention to, to tell people of other face, nationalities, or gender preferences, or any other way they may differ from us that they are not welcome? Will the next town meeting propose that we sam oh sorry, a similar phrase inscribed over the rear entrance of the town library reads, open to all. Will the next town meeting propose we sandblast that away as well? I'd like to point out two examples of when a government did not support the rights of its inhabitants to live together in peace. The first happened right here in Groton, when the Native Americans under the direction of the Commonwealth were hunted for their scalps and pushed to lash out in violent attacks which almost destroyed our town in, in, in its infancy. The second example deals with something very personal to me as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, referred to as the Mormons. On October 27, 1838, Missouri Governor Lilton Dup Boggs issued a military order to the state militia instructing that the Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state if necessary. These are only two examples of injustices that people who are different endured. There are many more, including Jim Crow laws, internment camps, etc. Do we want any part of that history? As you pointed out, this will all be reported in the news tomorrow. I say no, and I encourage everyone to vote a loud and empathetic no when this vote is called. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. Hi. I'm Eric Fisher. I have lived in Groton for 35 years, which at this point is approximately half of my life. So um, I, just, I just wanted to say that. Um, and I'm rising tonight to comment on the controversy uh, surrounding the placement of all or welcome signs at the road entrances to our town and advocate voting no on Article 1. First of all, I am clueless about how such a sentiment can be controversial or politically divisive, no matter what has been said this evening. 
In order for it to be such, no matter what was said this evening, there must be some people in the town who feel that all are not welcome. And so I must ask, who is not welcome? The Hindus who are building the Shirty Side Temple? How about the kids who wrote anti-Semitic and Nazi graffitis on the walls of a school bathroom right here in our town? Is it possibly gay or lesbian people? If so, my daughter, my late brother, my aunt, and my great aunt would not be welcome. Neither would the CEO of Apple Computer, nor at least one officer of the Massachusetts State Grange. Oscar, and Hammers, Oscar Hammerstein said it best in the words of one song in Rodgers and Hammerstein's musical, South Pacific. You've got to be taught to hate and fear. You've got to be taught from year to year. It's got to be drummed to your dear little ear. You've got to be carefully taught. These words were written in 1949. In an interesting echo of today's issue, the producers asked Hammerstein to withdraw this song from the musical because it was politically divisive. Hammerstein resisted then, and I resist now. In the earlier, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, a man named Edwin Markham wrote the following words. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Much earlier than that, Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan and advocated tolerance of the hated Romans. Now that this issue has been raised and the signs have been placed, I must support keeping them worded the way they are. Thank you. Over here, yes sir. Good evening. I'm speaking as a selectman and as an individual. A no on Article 1 says that we respect the votes of Springtown Meeting all of the votes, including the one that saved our seal. Before I get to that, let's talk about the facts of Article 1 situation and its spawn, Springtown Meeting Article 17. In a letter to the Groton Herald last week, the, the movers of Article 1 accused the selectmen of, quote, by positioning this article for a vote late on the second night of a town meeting, selectmen had clearly failed to encourage the widest possible participation in the decision. Of course, let's ignore the reality that five articles were considered after Article 17, by their logic, all those articles are questionable too, right? They claim that a 140 to 113 vote doesn't involve the town. Of course, they know that the maximum town meeting had that night was 256. So maybe 12 people either didn't vote or had left. That means that, yes, 253 town meeting attendees got their say. That's more than 95% of the high point attendance. Maybe my math is different than theirs, but that certainly seems like a great amount of town meeting participation. Yet not one person planned in advance to speak against Article 17. Oh, but what if they had? What if the proponents of Article 1 are trying to make you believe, preposterously, is that if they'd been able to speak, 14 voters would have changed their mind? Oh, if only Icarus were here to remind us the folly of such hubris. My friends, I have a secret. None of us can fly that close to the sun and not get burnt. As a selectman, I am on record as being willing to listen, to hear the concerns, asking reasonable questions, giving the citizens moving this article the benefit of the doubt. However, given more than ample time to respond, the proponents of Article 1 would rather evade my questions. This tells me one thing. This isn't a reasonable article. This is a request founded in fear grounded in bias, and created by the worst sentiment of all, being a sore loser. That's right, let me tell you what really happened. Because there were 321 people on the third night of town meeting, 321 people to debate the future of our seal, 56 more than the second night. Of course, that's still a very small part of 8800, but clearly that is enough to satisfy the proponents of Article 1, who did not present another citizen position to change that vote. No, what happened was that these people didn't plan ahead and didn't pay attention. And now they're asking you to ignore their lack of planning and let them have a chance to alter a previous vote. Again, I ask you, is the defeated side of town seal vote offered the same arguments? Would you accept them? 
Let me respond. The, mo the moment, the, the proponents say that they can raise money to pay for the change. So I ask you, if someone had been willing to raise the money to pay for the change to the town, to the town seal, would that make it okay? No, I tell you, this isn't any different. If you vote yes in Article 1, you're telling people that it's okay to destroy the work and will of members of our community. You're telling people that not only do we not care about your contributions to the neighborhood, but we, the town of Groton, through town meeting, reject you. Rejection seems to be the opposite of welcoming. The very acts of the proponents of Article 1 makes their choice of wording worthless. So now, here tonight, I stand in opposition to Article 1 because I am not a hypocrite. I stood with people here and joined with you in opposition to the change in our seal to do what is right. I ask you also affirm the validity of our spring town meeting, the same town meeting where we together, we decided to keep our town seal. I will vote no on this article and reaffirm the seal vote and every other vote at town meeting. Show your integrity and vote no with me. Mr. Valentine, did you want to respond? Yes, I would like to respond. Um, I have to note that the only hatred in this room has been aimed against the, propon the proponents of this article here. Let him speak. Quiet, please. It is not so when we say welcome that we mean that all are not welcome. And that should be very amply clear from our presentations. We are not haters, we are not bigots, and I should not be having to be put in a position to defend that. It is the allegations of, of hatred that are made here tonight, the allegations of bigotry. This article has been nothing but divisive in our town. Had we had an article that, that insulted the other side of this political uh, spectrum, I reiterate, I would be here objecting to it as vociferously as I do this particular statement. It is a political statement. And whether or not our selectman was naive or deceitful, the fact is, the fact is that this is perceived by many as being entirely one-sided. It is, it is a mantra for political causes and we have a long history in this town of not raising those in this town meeting and in this town forum. I hope that we can leave this meeting. Friends and neighbors, we do not, sitting here, these people do not say to you that some are not welcome. We are saying, some people are saying, you know, that, look, it's a bit disingenuous to say all are welcome. Obviously, some people, you know, if they're, if they're malefactors and stuff like that, you don't want them in the town. But, you know, the thing is, that's not the type of distinction we're making here. And it's ridiculous to assert that we're making that distinction. We are only making the point that the statement has been either co-opted or it is being used to launch this sleepy little town into a national focal point. We simply want a situation in this town where we can get away from Washington. What's, what, what happens in Washington should stay in Washington. Get up and state your point of order. Yeah, he's almost... Yeah. A, I, the chair recognized him to respond to specific statements that was made by an individual. Thank you, sir. Let him finish. Go ahead, sir. Finish up, please. It's very disappointing to hear the amount of, of uh, visceral hatred coming out of this, this, uh, out of this uh, auditorium tonight. And that hatred is not, is not being voiced by those that have supported this measure. In the back, yes, sir. <laughs> sir, in the back in the green shirt. Hello, I'm Matt Dallas from Lowell Road. Uh, all are welcome is not a political statement. 
I believe that being welcoming to all is an ideal, a common ideal that we should all try to live up to. I think the real political statement is saying that not all are welcome, is saying that only some people in all should be welcome, and sandblasting the all off as a dog whistle to tell some people that they're not welcome in Groton. Now I heard a, I heard someone ask a rhetorical question earlier, whether we really think that anyone will be walking around Groton and see the stone and feel more welcome. And I remember that we heard from another person who specifically said yes, that they did feel more welcome. So I guess that answers that question. I personally am not embarrassed about my stance on this issue. So in uh, regard to the other motion, I will be voting no on the secret ballot. Uh, if you're embarrassed about your beliefs on the issue, I advise you to vote yes on the secret ballot but you might have made a bad choice in living in New England where we have open town meetings. Thank you. Over here, yes ma'am. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Farbman Manning and I am a resident of Groton for about eight weeks now. And I, this is my first town meeting ever in my life. <laughs> And we moved here from New Jersey, and don't don't boo me yet. Um, and you can you can find my name uh, inscribed as a survivor of World War II in the Holocaust Museum in D.C. My father is um, was a survivor of World War II, and so uh, this is personal to me. When I was thinking of moving to Massachusetts from New Jersey. We lived about 20 miles outside of Manhattan in a very diverse community. I have two young kids that go to Florence Roche School. We practice and celebrate Diwali, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, and Christmas in our house. And I love that. And when I was thinking of moving to Massachusetts, I had a lot of people reach out to me and say, just so you know, um, they're not very diverse up there. And so when I went to back to school night, I looked around and there was one parent that was not Caucasian. And I was concerned about that as a parent for my children. And the rocks and the symbol, all are welcome, actually did make me feel like I am welcome and my children are welcome and that other people are welcome here too. And so maybe I could provide a little thought from the outside tonight. Um, it is a very positive message, one that I hold very dear to myself, and it makes me feel that I can sleep safe at night and comfortable knowing that I chose the right community to raise my children in. And I just want to say, the facts are, this is not a political message at all. The facts are it's a humanitarian message, and one that I hope my children can live to tell their children as they grow up in the town of Groton. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, Ellen Baxendale would like to speak. The wireless mic, Ms. Baxendale. Quiet, please. Ms. Uh, Ms. Ellen from Main Street, I would like to move both questions, please. There's been a motion to move the question. Is there a second? Second. <laughs> a motion to move the question suppresses debate. If you vote in favor of moving the question, we will move directly to first voting on fixing the method of voting by secret ballot. And then we will immediately move to voting on the main motion as shown on the screen by whatever method. The two options would then be by a hand vote, and if necessary, we would do a hand count. If you vote for a secret ballot, we would then use the secret ballot process outlined by Mr. Bouchard, and which will be repeated if that's the method you choose. 
So right now before you is a motion to move the question. It requires a two-thirds majority because it suppresses debate. All those in favor of the motion to move the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it by a two-thirds majority. We now move directly to the motion to fix the method of voting. The motion is, I move that when we vote on the main motion, we do so by a secret ballot. It requires a simple majority. The chair will hear it first. All those in favor of the motion to fix the method of voting by a secret ballot signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The no's have it. The motion to fix the method of voting by a secret ballot does not pass. Ladies and gentlemen, we now may move to the main motion on the screen. Does anybody need me to read it? Ladies and gentlemen, all those in favor of the, it requires a simple majority to pass. If you vote in favor, the words all are would be recommended to be removed. If you vote against it, no action will be, or the words would not be removed. All those in favor under the main motion, under Article 1, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Ladies and gentlemen, you have your yellow cards. <laughs> Chair's going to ask for a show of hands to see if it can be determined whether a majority is achieved. This might save us from having to do a hand count. All those in favor of the main motion, signify by raising your yellow card. Thank you. All those opposed to the main motion, signify by raising your yellow card. Ladies and gentlemen, the no's have it. Are, are, wait, don't leave yet, don't leave yet. Are there seven voters who wish to challenge the ruling of the chair? Please stand if you do. Seeing none, the chair declares that Article 1 has been defeated. Article 2, we move directly to Article 2. Ms. Pine. Quiet, please. The meeting is continuing. We have 18 other articles to dispose of. Ms. Pine. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to transfer from the Excess and Deficiency Fund, free cash, the sum of $16,500 for the payment of the following bill of a prior fiscal year, Sprague Energy, $16,500. Article two has been moved and seconded, Ms. Pine. Uh, this is a negotiated settlement of a bill that has been in dispute for a number of years. Um, I think it's safe to say that we are not terribly happy to have to pay this, but on the advice of town council, we have decided that it is in our best interest to pay than the negotiated amount rather than uh, take the risk of going into litigation and, and having to pay more in legal fees or in uh, whatever decision was reached by the legal process. Earlier today, the Finance Committee voted unanimously in favor of Article 2. Are there any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, sir. Just a simple question. Uh, what exactly is this about? Can you tell us? Uh, town Manager, Mr. Haddad. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. It's to pay a, a gas bill a distribution charge for the public safety building and the fire station. Are there any further questions under Article 2? Because it is a prior year bill, 
State law requires us to pass this by a four-fifths majority. The chair will attempt to achieve a four-fifths on a voice vote first in hopes of not counting. All those in favor of the main motion under Article 2 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I think my hearing is off. Um, <laughs> If, if we have, aren't able to get a unanimous vote, we will need to do a count. So let's do it again. All those in favor of the main motion under Article 2 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 2 passes by a unanimous vote. And the chair extends his thanks to the one voter who had a cough earlier. Article 3, Mr. Pease. I'm short. I move that the town vote to amend the fiscal year 2018 operating budget as adopted under Article 4 of the April 24th, 2017 Springtown meeting as follows. Each line item to be considered a separate appropriation for the purposes voted. General government. By increasing the general government appropriation from 1,946,980 to 1,961,480, so as to increase line item 1032, town manager expenses, by 10,000 from 4,000 to 14,000. Increase line item 1101, IT wages, by 500 from 47,753 to 48,253 and increase line item 1131, town clerk wages, by 4,000, from 54,589 to 58,589, and to raise and appropriate the sum of 14,500 to fund said increases. Article three has been moved and seconded, Mr. Pease. We'll have something up in a moment to explain things. So these are the various um, changes we're making as a result of different uh, issues or items that have happened. Uh, the $500 in the IT wages was a, a clerical error that uh, we just put uh, the wrong thing in the wrong column. Uh, the town clerk wages are as a result of some transitions we've made in town hall. And the uh, town, manager expenses, uh, town manager expenses are as a result of a uh, policy that the selectmen have adopted to uh, enable um, meeting t minutes taking at our me at several of the committee's meetings. Early in the evening, the finance committee voted five in favor, one against, to recommend Article Three. Are there any questions? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. No. The ayes have it. Article Three passes by a majority vote. Article 4, Mr. Gaminer. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote to transfer the sum of $90,000 from the Sewer Enterprise Fund Surplus to the fiscal year 2018 Sewer Enterprise Department budget for engineering services related to the Pepper, Pepperell Wastewater Treatment Plant upgrades. Article 4 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Gaminer. Briefly, uh, Pepperell was in the process of upgrading the wastewater treatment plant. When we were doing our budget last year for this fiscal year, Pepperell had told us, this, that is us, the sewer commission, that they would be rolling the engineering costs into the final bond. Uh, since then, they decided that they would like to pay as we go, and so we need this transfer. Are there questions on Article 4? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. Article four passes by a unanimous vote. Article five, Mr. Deegan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to transfer the sum of 500,000 
dollars from the excess and deficiency fund free cash to be added to the sum already on deposit in the capital stabilization fund. Article 5 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Deegan. Yes, uh, before I move on with an explanation of this and any other money articles coming from free cash, the town manager would like to make a statement concerning uh, the free cash situation as it stands at the moment. Town manager, Mr. Haddad. Thank you, Mr. Deegan. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This year, free cash was certified at $2,369,261. This has raised a concern among some members of the community that we purposely under budget receipts and over budget expenditures. While we do budget conservatively in both budget expenditures and revenues, we are doing this in compliance with recommendations from the Department of Revenue. The DOR recommends that we understand the role free cash plays in sustaining the town's strong credit rating. Currently, Groton has a AAA bond rating that allows the town to borrow money at favorable rates that saves residents and taxpayers money and interest costs. Under sound financial policies, we strive to generate free cash in an amount equal to 3 to 5 percent of our budget. This prevents the town from depleting free cash in any particular year and enables the town to begin the next year with a positive balance. This is exactly what we do here in Groton. We develop conservative revenue projections and departmental appropriations to ensure we have adequate funding to maintain services and generate the recommended amount of free cash. It is important to understand that we establish both estimated revenues and departmental appropriations a full 18 months before the end of the fiscal year in which we expect the revenues and expenses. It is virtually impossible to predict what will happen over an 18 month period and as stated, the guidelines provided to us by the Department of Revenue tells us to be conservative. In addition to that, estimated revenues are just that, they're estimates. They're not guaranteed like property tax revenue each year and we need to be conservative to avoid revenue deficits. As far as the FY18 certification, we also corrected an accounting error from the previous year's certification. $841,000 of this amount is an audit adjustment in FY17 based on a closing entry correction from FY16 that was made after free cash had been certified in September of 2016. While the Department of Revenue would have been willing to recertify free cash to include that amount in the event of some particular financial need, the town had no plans to spend those funds immediately and therefore the DOR asked the town to defer spending that amount until this year's free cash could be certified this September. This caused an increase in the most recent free cash certification by that amount of the audit adjustment. Finally, I want to point out that we develop our budgets and revenue projections in the best interest of the residents and taxpayers and will continue to do so. I would ask for a, a slide up here. It, it, this may be hard to see, but the, the middle column under the free cash amount shows the amount of some money that we're going to be asking for. At the conclusion of this meeting, if every article that is, that is requested funding for free cash is approved, it will leave a balance of $582,401 in our free cash. The reason that we want to leave that balance after this meeting is in the spring, we will be asking the town meeting to transfer $272,000 out of free cash to pay down some debt that the town meeting has previously appropriated. By doing that, we'll be able to pay it off earlier and allow the town to save money and interest costs over the life of the bonds. In addition to that, to comply with GASB 43, OPEB? 40? Uh, and to comply with GASB 45, I get the numbers confused, I apologize. Uh, we're going to transfer $100,000 out of free cash as well to, to build our OPEB balance as we did at the Springtown meeting. At the conclusion of that, we will have a balance of 210401 in free cash. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Deegan, do you have anything further? Yes, I do. So basically on this article, what this is asking you folks to do is put $500,000 back into our capital stabilization fund. What we use that stabilization fund is not to impact our budget for non-reoccurring expenses such as police cruisers and large ticket items that we have to purchase which are on the warrant every spring and delivered to you folks under separate motions. We spent about four hundred and eighty odd thousand dollars just south of five hundred thousand dollars back in the spring of 2017 on these items as approved by you town meeting voters. What we do is once free cash is certified, we replenish that fund because the DOR wants us to have at least 1.5 
percent of our operating budget in our capital stabilization fund. Our capital stabilization plan for capital purchases goes out 10 years, but is extremely accurate for, or very accurate, I should say, for five years. Certain things will come up on a given year that require changes, or a truck or a vehicle may last longer, a uh, piece of equipment that doesn't need replacement. So as a result, when we come to you next spring, the money will be in place, and what's in spring, uh, FY19 capital plan is 482,000. So if you replenish it, we will be just north of 5%, I'm sorry, 1.5%, and we will have that money in place in case you approve all of the capital purchases for next year. Thank you. Yes, sir, in the back. Uh, yes, I have a question on the free cash. Where does that money come from, from the taxpayers? The, the question is, where does the free cash money come from, Mr. Deegan? From the taxpayers? Sure, I'll, I'll answer part of the question for you. When money is returned that's not used within budgets at the end of the year, it flows back into the free cash account. When we send out excise tax bills and things along those lines, uh, unanticipated receipts, such as meals taxes and things along those lines, they come and they go into free cash. In the case of this year, there was just north of $800,000 uh, that the DOR certified uh, late before, after our original free cash number was certified, so it got added to this current year's free cash. So what happens is when it goes into that account, we can use that for purchases and things such as uh, are on the warrant this evening or would be on the warrant in the springtime meeting that would not impact the tax rate. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, but, but when you look at uh, the amount that they're going to give back to the taxpayers, since this, this money comes from the taxpayers, they're only going to allot $100,000, but the senior center gets 400000 the capital fund budget gets 500000 but the people who put in that money get significantly less, and I think it's inequitable to try to, you know, take it out of the taxpayer again. Last year, we proposed somewhere in the range of $600,000, Mark? $400,000 to offset the tax rate to be returned directly to the taxpayer. The FinCom recommended against doing that because they thought there was better fiscal ways to spend that money moving forward in the future. Whereas I, at the time, followed the sentiment that you had. It was money out of my pocket, and I wanted it back. However, I'll give you the however. And this year, I do not support offsetting the tax rate. Because when we use free cash for things that you'll hear this evening as well as next spring, such as paying off debt early, by paying off debt early, that is saving the taxpayers money. It's less money that's coming out of your pocket. So the bottom line is, theoretically, the concept that you're talking about, it's taxpayer dollars and it should go back to you all, does hold a lot of weight in my mind and in my pocket. By the same token, it's like pay me now or pay me later. And that's one of the situations that you all have to make a judgment call on. And this is the call that the selectmen are recommending and that the FinCom is recommending at this it's juncture, just, sir. It's just the inequity between the other funds and the taxpayer, what it gets back. Understood. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Hi, Pat Judge off Prescott Street. My concern with the free cash issue is that it circumvents the two-thirds vote for any major capital uh, project. And, and you guys collect this money, and then when you don't think you're going to get a two-thirds vote, you, you toss it at projects, and, it's, and then you th they'll throw another article later in the meeting to, to refill the fund. If you have a real, if you have a project that's significant to the entire town, then I think it's by putting it into free cash, so you don't need a two-thirds vote, is disingenuous. Mr. Hedden, Mr. Moderator, just just a, a couple of clarifications in, in, into your statement. Free cash comes from taxation, and when town meeting appropriates that money, they do it by a majority vote. What we're proposing under this article is pretty much exactly what you're saying. We're asking that this money, by majority vote, be placed into the capital stabilization fund for a future town meeting to appropriate. To take money out of the capital stabilization fund, it requires a two-thirds vote. 
So we are recommending to you tonight to take that free cash and put it into a fund that will require two-thirds vote of town meeting to spend that money on items. I think that addresses your concern. Thank you. Aren't you yes, tonight sir. asking us for a 51% vote for the senior center using free cash to fund that? That particular article will require a majority vote, yes. Okay, and you're using free cash? Yes. Okay. That's exactly my point. There will be an article later on in terms of offsetting the tax rate. And you could amend that article to offset the tax rate to whatever number you wanted within the free cash amount that's left. However, we do like to keep a free cash balance of at least $200,000, and the town manager would like to keep more. Uh, bottom line is, it is your money. And as I said, that all these articles that are coming forward, you have the option of using the free cash that's on hand in terms of funding them, regardless if it's a majority or a two-thirds vote. This is for funding, in the case of the senior center, when you hear about that, for a design and not for a funding for the building of the structure itself. Yeah, I understand. Oh, here, yes, sir. Hi. Um, I, just, I just wanted to, almost a point of information. Um, in the year 2001, in the year 2000, uh, um, a man named George Bush campaigned for the presidency on the concept, uh, partly, that, uh, that we uh, had been overtaxing and we had a surplus and we should reduce tax rates and give the money back to the taxpayers. Um, this was ill-advised as uh, President Clinton left office with a budgetary surplus. Um, and so my point is this, that in the interest of fiscal conservatism, let's keep these funds sequestered because I think that I think that this gives us a lot more flexibility and much more immunity from sudden debt. Are other questions or comments? Article 5 requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the main motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 5 passes by a majority vote. Article 6. Ms. Minugian. I move that the town vote to transfer the sum of zero dollars from the excess and deficiency fund, free cash, to be added to the sum already on deposit in the stabilization fund. Article 6 has been moved and seconded. Ms. Minugian. I move that Article 6 be indefinitely postponed. The motion to indefinitely postpone has been made and seconded. It does not suppress debate. Ms. Minugian. So it, effectively, the state recommends that we have a certain level of uh, money in the stabilization fund, which we currently have. Hence, there's no need to add to it at this point. Are there any questions? The motion seeks to indefinitely postpone action on the main motion. And if passed, the meeting will move to the next order of business. And we, we need to take an action on this warrant article because it's in the warrant. So the action that you're being asked to take is to indefinitely postpone the main motion. Are there any questions? Motion to indefinitely po postpone requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The motion passes by a unanimous vote. Article 7, Mr. Deegan. Thank you again, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to transfer the sum of $175,000 from the receipts reserved for appropriation and transfer the sum of $275,000 from the excess and deficiency fund free cash for a total sum of $450,000 to be expended by the town manager for the purposes of hiring an architect and or engineer pursuant to the designer selection guidelines adopted by the Board of Selectmen in December of 2010 for design or design and construction bidding process of a new senior center and or the renovation and expansion of the current senior center and all costs associated and related thereto. 
Main motion under Article 7 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Deegan. Yes, at this juncture, I'd like to turn this over to Peter Cunningham and company from uh, the Senior Center Committee, where they can explain this process further. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham and Mr. Emerald. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, moderator, Mr. Deegan, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Cunningham. I'm chairman of the Senior Center Building Committee, and I'm joined uh, this evening up here by John Emerald, who also is a member of, uh, of our committee. Uh, I'd just like to start with a brief uh, opening uh, statement. And the Senior Center uh, Review Committee was created last May to continue the planning process that had been started by the Town Meeting Senior Center Review Committee, which had presented two articles to the Spring Town Meeting. One article addressed the site selection, while the other dealt with uh, funding architectural plans, which could then be put out to bid to determine an actual cost for a new center. Both articles required voter affirmation at town elections, which they did not receive. Since then, the Senior Center Building Committee has been working hard to analyze that vote and to address many of the questions and concerns we heard. We believe support of Article 7 will give townspeople the ability to fully understand what the impact will be on the taxpayer to address many of the significant issues that affect the current center and the Council on Aging's ability to provide adequate programming to Groton's ever-increasing senior population. So could we uh, move to the next slide, please? So this is, and, and much of this I think you've heard before, we've certainly prevented this before, uh, why we do we need a new senior center, uh, existing substandard accessibility, increase in the uh, senior population, and space limitations for program offerings. Uh, the planning process and looking at this has been going on for uh, close to three years. Uh, there has been community-wide surveys that have been conducted, there have been forums, there have been uh, charrettes that we've held to try to uh, get the town's input into this process and to understand the needs. We know just uh, strictly based on demographics and uh, statistics that the senior population is in fact growing and the need for services uh, within our community is, is increasing because of that. Next slide. So here we have a look at the, at the current building. And I'm, do you want to make some comments about that? Um, some of you who have been over there um, might be familiar with the uh, front of the building and the ramp. It's been expanded. There now is a new ramp on the side. Uh, to, to provide uh, handicap accessibility to the emergency exit, which was not there before and was uh, kind of a problem because there was only really one way out uh, that, was, that was accessible. Uh, the building is really dominated at this point uh, by the ramps. <clears throat> Next slide. This is the uh, reception area at the center when you walk in. Uh, the uh, activities coordinator is manning the front desk there. A lot of her work. Uh, needs to be done in private and not in an open space like that, and this is uh, uh, not uh, conducive to, to good programming when you have uh, people that are coming in and may have uh, issues or concerns that are somewhat personal and there's, there's no real um, you know, closed off space or private space to conduct those conversations. So we did a, a fair amount of listening. Um, we, we did some surveys, we reached out to different groups, and. Uh, what we heard is that the uh, cost of the final project as presented at the last town meeting uh, was too high. We had had a feasibility plan that had been prepared. The town had paid for a consultant, engaged a consultant to do that. Taking the analysis and the space needs that we had prevented at the time, they came back with a plan that uh, uh, had a building of roughly 12,000 square feet and a cost estimate in excess of $6 million. And we clearly, uh, you know, heard the message and, and a lot of the subsequent outreach we did, I think, verified the fact that people thought that simply was, was too much uh, to spend. Uh, we also heard that people uh, did not think that we were really looking at, uh, you know, renovating the current building or if that was possible. And uh, part of what we're proposing going forward in this motion is to, is to actually look at that and to address some of the underlying critical uh, issues that need to be addressed if you're considering a renovation. Uh, the building was constructed in 1990, the building code at the time. Uh, was the earlier version of the State Building Code. We're now under a new version of the State Building Code, and making the building uh, compliant with that code would, would present challenges, but we intend to look at that thoroughly. Um, and then also we felt that there was confusion. There were two questions uh, on the ballot, as you recall. One uh, had to do with uh, determining uh, where the uh, facility would, would be located, uh, and the other related more specifically to uh, the facility and doing plans uh, for the uh, building to, to be at the current site in West Groton. Yeah. Thanks, Don. 
Uh, good evening. I'm John Emerald, and again, a member of the uh, Senior Center Review Committee. As Peter was saying, we heard loud and clear from the community some of the concerns that, that uh, the voters had and the residents of the community. Um, one of the things that uh, was very important is that we do study with the architect that has been selected if this warrant article is approved, the feasibility of doing a, a renovation in addition to the existing facility. Uh, in going through that, there, there are three things that would be weighed. It would be the cost, the functionality, and the accessibility to the building. That would then be compared to that cost, ex functionality, accessibility to an ad renovate. So it is a process. We would not be spending money to do two de complete design studies, but working very closely with a professional architect that not only has been in business for, I think, in excess of 25 or 30 years, but the community understands the needs of the community. Uh, and, and has been at town meeting in the past, so understands what the voters' concerns are as well. The, um, the, it, just to reiterate what Peter said, the original firm, Reinhardt, that, that put the number for a 13,500 square foot center at in excess of $6.5 million. Nobody on this committee at any time was in favor of spending that kind of money, and we went to work to try and find ways to bring those costs to a number that we felt that the town could support. Uh, that included working very closely with the uh, director of the Council on Aging, Kathy Shelp, and with, with the Council on Aging itself to determine what exactly were their space requirements, where could we eliminate some of the wants, but focus truly on the needs uh, of the seniors, of the programs that are being offered. We've now got the building down to somewhere between nine and 11,000 square feet, and again, in, in working with the architect, we are not compromising the integrity of the project. We're not simply saying do away with A, B, and C programs, but we're okay with D, E, and F. There are ways to design these facilities to build them very cost efficiently and to utilize the space. Uh, one of those ways is to cut down from, on average, in a lot of public buildings or in, in buildings in general, 25% of the building being for common areas and utilities and so forth. There's no reason why with the needs of this senior center and the needs of our community, we can't get that number down to 15%. That's a huge reduction in the square footage. Uh, the site, as Peter said, has been determined. Um, the West Groton site is a property that's owned by the town. It helps us keep our cost under control. We are, have had some preliminary uh, work done in terms of where the wetlands are. We've identified the issues. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively flat site. There's no substantial, you know, natural uh, impediments to the development there. Uh, we certainly would have to work within the conservation guidelines and so forth, but it's a known site. It is something that we feel that the community uh, voiced very clearly that they'd be in support of that existing site, and again, from a cost perspective. Uh, I will, I'm going to turn it over to Peter for the cost, for the debt exclusion. Thank you. Right. Uh, as you recall, last time there was a vote on this, and uh, ironically, it turned out that that really is the first time that there ever has been a debt exclusion vote uh, to, um, uh, to vote on f uh, funds that were going to be spent for architectural plans or renderings uh, or the bid specification documents uh, on any major project in this town. Typically, uh, the debt exclusion vote is uh, reserved until you know what that final project is and you're going out, to, um, uh, you know, going out to bid on it, and you have actual bids in hand, and then you go to town meeting, you seek the approval, and then it's debt excluded, whatever that number might be. So that was a little unusual. It was, it was done this way last time, and, and uh, uh, this time uh, we're proposing that it go forward. The sources of fund are going to be free cash, and then uh, receipts that were received from the sale of, of some town properties that will actually fund it. This will allow us to come back to the spring town meeting with some actual <laughs> hard numbers for what a project is going to cost the community uh, and to have a dialogue with the community about that uh, and specific plans of what that's going to be. And we think that's the most uh, straightforward way to, to advance, the, advance the project and to, uh, uh, you know, engage the community in, in what we're talking about. Next slide, please. So uh, one, of the, one of the problems that we've identified uh, in the current facility is just the current um, uh, code compliance issues and uh, the lack of accessibility. Uh, to address those issues, uh, we've had estimates that show it would be in excess of $900,000 to correct those, which would simply make the building uh, code compliant and address the accessibility issues, but do nothing in terms of increasing the program space that we've clearly identified needs to be addressed. 
Uh, and it would, quite honestly, if you uh, recall that earlier slide that was up there, be a waste of uh, good money going into that uh, facility the way it looks right now. Um, ADA compliance is enforced through legal grievances. Uh, we've been fortunate to date, but if someone chose to uh, file a grievance uh, with the, uh, you know, with the state that our building for our most, you know, vulnerable citizens, really, our senior citizens, was not accessible, <laughs> uh, the town, I think, would be in a difficult position trying to defend itself. Next slide, please. So this is what will the design phase cause? So we're looking uh, right now, we've actually had gone out to bid. We've uh, uh, identified a, a, an architect and a uh, um, owner's uh, project manager for the, which we need to, uh, we're required to because we're a, uh, a public entity required to have a, uh, a project manager involved. Uh, we've um, identified an architect who will do the work for $310,000. Uh, we have $125,000 that needs to be uh, dedicated to the uh, owner's project manager, and then there's a contingency of $15,000 contained in that, that uh, if it is not spent, uh, would be used towards the final project going forward. Uh, so that's an outline of what the $450,000 will do. Um, and again, what will you get for this? This is not uh, unique to this project. It's done for every building and renovation project. The feasibility of build uh, versus a renovate versus new build, uh, that's something the committee will work on very closely. Uh, we will be very uh, open reporting back to the different uh, you know, boards in town, so the selectmen and I think the finance committee uh, on those decision points as we go along and we would be holding public meetings on that to make sure that everyone's informed. Um, and then we get, I think, an, you know, again, an exact cost to the final project. That's something that, again, I think is important uh, for us to be able to bring forward and present to towns, uh, townspeople so they understand exactly what this project is going to cost and what it's going to, you know, what it's going to gain. Uh, the other thing it enables us to do is that by having uh, an, a project, an actual hard uh, design project, a physical project, it enables us to go out into the community and solicit private contributions to this project. And uh, we know from a lot of the work we've done in reaching out to other uh, senior centers that uh, a lot of the components of their uh, projects, what they put on, was comprised of, po uh, of private money that went into it. Somebody might have donated a particular room. Maybe the kitchen was outfitted by a private donator. Maybe a certain room or equipment was outfitted by a private donator. Uh, we know that there is private money out there that would uh, be able to come into this project, would like to come into this project. But they really can't do that unless we have a, you know, a solid concrete project to present. And next, okay, why now? Do you want to cover this, John? <clears throat> yeah, I think just in general, uh, and there's been some questions that were, were put before our committee as we came back to town meeting for a second time. Some people were asking, you know, why come back in if it was defeated at the town ballot? And I want to remind everybody that town meeting did approve the prior warrant articles to move forward with the funding for the study and for a selection of, of land for the construction of the new senior center. In asking around after the defeat of the question at the ballot and going to uh, some town officials that had their, were they aware of any other project of this type and nature that was required to go to the town ballot before they had the actual numbers and the bid specs and the construction drawings in hand and hard bids to be able to bring to the townspeople and say this is the number based on the work that's been done by the design professionals, by the uh, civil engineers, the architects, and the structural engineers and everybody else that's involved in that process. And I, not one town official could tell me that they, they couldn't cite another instance in where a town meeting uh, approval for this type of project and this type of funding then required a, a follow-up at the spring town meeting. So we're basically coming back after hearing the concerns of the community and saying, let's, let's bring this forth as the history of all of these other projects you know, have been brought forth let the voters at town meeting allow this project to go forward, the funding for it, for the design phase, and then it will come to town meeting with real numbers. You, nobody can stand up right tonight and say it, it should, it's going to cost five or six million dollars. Uh, we know that that won't fly. Uh, we've already been talking with the architect just to get some feedback from them as to what, and we interviewed three architects, and this came up to each one of them. So our job is to bring this, if it's approved tonight, is to work with the architect, with, work with the design team, and bring this in at a number that we feel would be acceptable to the town. We know that that number is certainly 
not at six, six and a half million. It's probably more likely in that four to four and a half million dollar range. So this, this allows us to move forward as the other warrant articles of this nature have. Um, the, the costs of, of this uh, funding the design uh, for this, uh, again, just allows this to come forward to the town. We have, a, we have an excellent architect that's here tonight, and certainly as we open it up for questions and comments, uh, whether it's Kathy, the, the COA director, or uh, Greg with, with the architectural firm, we are prepared to address any and all of your concerns tonight. Thank you. So in conclusion, I think there, there really is, uh, I think, very little uh, disagreement, uh, amongst, uh, I, I think, amongst most people that have uh, visited the Senior Center and understand the, uh, what goes on there, the programming that goes on there, that there, that there is a serious issue that needs to be addressed in terms of that facility. Um, failure to do so, again, I mentioned this previously, could expose us to, you know, to some sort of uh, complaint which could compel us to spend uh, a, a very um, large amount of money and not really realize any benefit, I think, to the community. So um, we're asking for your support tonight in this article, article 7 so that we can actually go out, uh, bring back to town meeting a, a concrete design with concrete numbers to know exactly what this project is going to cost uh, to, address, uh, um, you know, to address the needs that we've identified and that I think most people in the community are familiar with. So I think that, uh, that ends our uh, formal presentation, uh, presentation at this point. OK, thank you. Uh We'll now move on to committee reports. Uh, Mr. Press, did you have a report from the Finance Committee? Yes, I do, Mr. Moderator. My name is Art Press. I'm a member of the Finance Committee, and the Finance Committee supports this wholeheartedly, unanimously. Um, I'm going to change hats now. Right, can, I put, can I put you on hold there for a second? Because I have one more committee report. I'm sorry, I should have said that earlier. I'll get the other committee report and then come back to you when we open the floor. And the, the other committee report is from the planning board, Ms. Perkins. Uh, at the regular meeting on September 14th, the planning board voted to recommend approval of this Warren article proposed by the Senior Center Building Committee. The planning board voted uh, four in favor and one opposed. Right, and Ms. Gilbert, did you have a committee report? I do. As the chair of the school committee, I'm pleased to announce that on September 20th, the Groton Dunstable School Committee voted to officially support Article 7 Senior Center Design for the Groton Fall Town Meeting. And I will come back up for my impersonal remarks. Great. Thank you. Are there any other committee reports? Yes, too. Yes, Ms. Collette. Uh, Michelle Collette, and I am speaking as ADA coordinator. The Commission on Accessibility met on September 11th and voted unanimously to support um, this article. And members of the Commission um, know more um, personally than um, most why this need is so compelling at this time and the lack of compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Ar Architectural Access Board regulations are the compelling. The commission had a joint meeting with the Council on Aging in May after the ballot question was voted down to identify uh, which of the identified deficiencies were uh, a real um, safety concern, which is why the um, ramp was extended this summer. Um, but on behalf of the Commission on Accessibility, we really hope that you support this article. The report from the Board of Selectmen, Mr. Deegan. The selectmen voted three in favor, two with no position. Uh, Mr. Eason. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. At its regular meeting on Tuesday, the Sustainability Commission voted three in favor and one abstention to support Article 7. Are there any other committee reports? Seeing none, Mr. Prest. Speaking as a voter, the floor is now open. Uh, yes, as I indicated with the uh, approval of the town moderator, I'm changing hats and now speaking as a citizen of Groton, a senior citizen of Groton. I hope that you'll join me in supporting the need for a new or possibly totally revamped senior center located at its current location in West Groton. I can't emphasize this enough. The existing senior center as it stands is a disgrace to the town of Groton 
and its citizens, young and old. There have been some debate as to what the senior center will cost. If any of you have ever built a house or had a house built for you, you know that you must start with a design and that design must, must fit your needs. To ask what your new house is going to cost without having a design to base the, the house costs on is outright absurd. The Senior Center Building Committee with the Council on Aging have done a great job in identifying the future needs for, a future, for the Senior Center. The process has been going on for eight years and has been done in earnest for the last three years. It's time to stop this nonsensical debate and stop screwing around with the needs of the senior citizens. The local newspaper has been touting a $5 million price tag with absolutely no facts to base their numbers on. I think you'll hear more on this later, but generally an architect's design fee is about 10 to 12% of the eventual construction cost. In this article, the architectural design cost is $310,000, as was shown earlier, and therefore a viable estimate for cost construction will be in the $3.1 to $3.7 million range, not $5 million. In addition, there are building cost estimators on the internet, and as an example, a 10,000 square foot community center, they don't show a senior center, but a community center is basically the same thing, built in this area using a high cost index would cost less per square foot than estimated by the 10 to 12 percent approach that I just mentioned. Even if we include the fact that public buildings tend to cost more than commercial buildings because of union labor and other public construction requirements, the cost per square foot for a senior center doesn't even come close to the $470 per square foot that some people have been bantering about. Seniors now make up 22 percent of the population are rotten and deserve better. So folks, let's stop listening to the naysayers and step up to the plate and approve Article 7. Thank you for listening. John Fun. Mr. Medina. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Mike Manugin, and I'm the chair of the now defunct Charter Review Committee that completed its work last spring. One of the recommendations that was made was that no expenditures be allowed to be made in the fall town meeting. And we, and we discussed this at great length, and uh, we said, well, we, and we, the consensus was that was a good idea, but it was a little too stringent, because sometimes you have to make emergency expenditures or expenditures that are time dependent or expenditures for things that are, you know, like a broken boiler, you just have to do that. You have to pay last year's bills. So we said, well, let's define what an emergency is, or time dependent is. And that's something we couldn't do. So the end result was to say, let's leave it up to the voters to decide. Why do we say we don't want to make any expenditures in the fall? That's because all of the town expenditures are made in the spring, in the spring town meeting. And what the problem is, if you make expenditures in the fall, you're not doing any of the trade-offs between what you're considering in the fall and what's going to come up for the, the town operating budget and the town capital budget in the spring. So we can spend, you know, a million dollars at this town meeting and then find out in the spring, oh darn, it would have been nice to have that million dollars. Because we don't know what the other expenditures are. And people can project for six months out and say, well, there's nothing coming down the pike. Well, oftentimes things do come down the pike. A, a fire engine is needed, a new cruiser is needed, whatever it is. So I would urge you on this article and on the school uh, article and on the article to return $100,000 to the taxpayers to consider what's going to happen if the money goes out and then you consider the budget in the spring and the money is needed. And the thing about giving money back to the taxpayers is it may sound great now, but I think for most people it's easier if the tax rate is relatively stable or climbs relatively smoothly. But if you give money back, all that means is you're going to take more money later on. So I would urge you to consider 
whether these are important enough, whether they're time dependent, whether they're emergencies, or whether they should be considered in the context of the entire town budget where you can make real trade-offs. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cunningham? Yeah, thank you. Oh, sure. Just a couple of points I'd like to respond uh, to that. I think, I mean, uh, number one, it's not true. I mean, the fall town meeting, in fact, in the past has approved money articles. That has happened before. But more uh, succinctly, and to the point Mr. Manugian raised, I think our desire is to come back to that annual town meeting in the spring with hard numbers for what a, a center might cost and for that conversation to take place vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, items that may come up in, in terms of the budget for the next fiscal year. We want that discussion to occur, but we want it to occur with hard numbers so that we can, you know, explain to the voters what that's going to cost. Mr. Green, Chairman of the Finance Committee, did you want to respond? I did, thank you. Uh, so this is a topic that I've heard come up frequently, actually, in the previous years, but a lot, particularly this year. Uh, when, when do we spend money in the fall? And I can say, um, in the several years that I've been on the Finance Committee, the Finance Committee has been uh, iterating, reiterating your words around not wanting to spend money at the fall, wait to the spring where we can do it in context of the rest of the spending. However, there are instances, and I'm going to reiterate exactly the instances you said, where it makes sense to spend money now in the fall. And that's when um, there, are, there are things that we couldn't have anticipated when we did budgeting, um, to, to Mr. Haddad's earlier comment. We're doing budgeting 18 months in advance, so there, there are sometimes some things that pop up that we could not have anticipated. Um, and the second criteria that we typically use on the Finance Committee is if there is a good reason to spend now as opposed to waiting. And so there are numerous articles tonight where, where there is indeed some spending. This is one of them. Um, the Finance Committee believes that there is a good reason to spend it now because by doing it now we can come back when we are actually asking for the real money associated with this project uh, in the spring so that we can have that conversation in the spring where we're comparing the cost for this project with all the other costs and the other priorities that we're going to have to vote on in the spring. And I think you'll also find that the other things that we're voting on tonight, um, some, some capital infrastructure investment for the schools is related to uh, safety. Um, again, we, we can address them as, as they come up, but we really, on the Finance Committee, push back hard about doing spending. And ultimately, per Mr. Manugian, it is up to you to decide whether, you know, this really does meet the, the requirements. It's not a requirement, I guess, sort of philosophy um, for when you might want to spend it in the fall. But I would, I would personally argue very strongly that in this particular article, going into spring town meeting with solid numbers so that we can actually make those trade-offs, I think it's important to spend this money and the, the Finance Committee, as, as previously reported, voted unanimously in support of this article. Any um, I, I think Mr. Cunningham's uh, point is very well taken. Uh, I'll just want to point out that we're spending, we're, looking at spending a million and a half dollars to do the uh, design and then just to get it up to ADA compliance. So the floor, so it was $960 to make it ADA compliant, right? right Mr. Amaral, oh, I'm just, buy it please, I, Mr. I'm, just, I'm, I'm not saying we're spending it now, but I'm saying in order to make it ADA compliant and in order to do this design, it's going to cost us a million and a half dollars. Now to add, you know, Could, am I wrong? Mr. Amaral, may, may I clarify? Yes, Mr. Amaral. Thank you, Mr. Mubin. The, um, the 900 and some odd thousand dollars that was talked about to bring it to a code compliance for accessibility, if nothing is done, then an architect who previously examined, reviewed, did an in-depth analysis of the, of the facility determined that it was close to a million dollars simply to bring it up into compliance with accessibility. That is money that whether or not this warrant is approved very likely is going to have to be sp spent by the town because it, 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 we heard earlier from our uh, accessibility code compliance uh, person, Michelle, that it, it's not in compliance and that there have been some issues. So there are two unrelated things. It's not a duplication of spending that million and then coming back and saying we're now seeking another X dollars for the ad renovate or the new construction. It's, it's going to be one or the other, not both. Yes, Mr. Manugan. 
I'm not saying this very well. Uh, what I mean to say is there's a floor of a million and a half dollars before you start to add anything to the, to the current facility. Because no matter what you do, you have to make it code compliant. So the, the resulting facility is going to cost at least a million and a half dollars. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, did you want up. to respond to that? Yeah, I, uh, it's, I mean, I, I, you know, again, one of the dangers in throwing numbers around is that you, we, you, know, you don't know that until you actually have engaged uh, an architect to look at it, to do that assessment, to review the code compliance involved, certainly our building inspector in doing that, uh, to know what an exact number is. And uh, again, the, the decision about whether we go forward and come back to town meeting with a totally new facility or an add slash renovate uh, to the current facility is something the committee will make working with the architect and, and using that information that they're able to provide us uh, in, in terms of uh, co-compliance and what it would cost. I mean, that's something we want to look at. We're not ruling it out, but we certainly want to look at it. And we would appreciate that there would be challenges in trying to do that. Okay. All set? May I ask a question? Yeah, one more question, yeah. Come on, Mike. Um, what, what are the requirements for the new design? How many, what are the room requirements? The, uh, you know, what are the general requirements that you're going to give to the engineer to do the design? We, again, as Mr. Amaral mentioned, we're looking uh, in the area of between 9 to 11,000 square feet. We're going to be working with the architect on that. Uh, there's going to be uh, room for, um, you know, for private office space again. There'll be a, a, a community room that'll be available for larger functions. And also, again, this is not just for the senior uh, community. This is also for the community at large. There will be space for community groups that uh, currently use the center and would like additional space to do some are of their Are there activities. specific requirements or general requirements? I mean, are they written down They're somewhere? They, they are written down somewhere. Yes, they are. I, I can direct you, in fact, to the website where there's a page that shows what the square footage is. And we've, look, we've actually looked at that and, and we looked, there was an original estimate that was done as part of the assessment. Uh, and then we modified that uh, to, to bring it down to that nine to 11,000 square foot range. Okay, thank you. Room size and everything. In the back, yes sir. Sure, Alan Donald, Floyd Hill. Uh, I'm a short timer here. I've only lived here about five years. Got a couple of questions for town council. First question is, it a legal requirement for Groton to have a standalone senior center. And what's your second question? The second question is, if we were sued because it wasn't ADA compliant, could we just close it and avoid potential litigation? Then I've got a couple of other things I'd like to. Town Council, Mr. Dineski. Mr. Moderator, it is not a legal requirement, in my opinion, that a community have a standalone senior center. On the second question, if we were sued, there are a number of potential plaintiffs. It could be an individual, it could be an office of government, either in the state or the federal government. Uh, I could not predict with any certainty what the outcome would be, but I would be surprised if simply closing the center would be satisfactory to any enforcement lawsuit from a government agency. Okay, thank you. Um, second, uh, the $450,000 expenditure that we're talking about right here. I'm aware it will get us designs that will then get us to a vote on overall funds, which have been estimated somewhere between three and change, I think that was Art, four and change, I, I believe that was Peter. And I would question whether we want to spend 450 grand to then bring a, a request for funds that are s two to three times larger than the monies we asked for for the school and voted down. Uh, we may wind up with some fairly expensive architectural plans that really aren't going to go anywhere. And then third, uh, final, even though it won't affect the tax rate uh, because it's coming out of free cash and uh, the uh, sale of other properties. It's still money that Groton uses and has for other purposes. This isn't like magic money, though it won't affect my tax rate. It's money that's, that could be spent for other purposes. So we should consider that when we're approving this fu these funds. Personally, I think this is kind of silly, but 
I'll let everybody else decide. Thank you. Mr. I, Mr. Amaral. Thank Mr. you. I, I think the question consider it is a very valid one. And while you're taking that into consideration, when you think about the monies that have been very wisely spent on the schools, in which the seniors in many cases have supported, not only on the fiscal expenditures, but in terms of their time that's been dedicated to the school children, those, those were wise investments. What we're talking about here is an expenditure in the range that was just mentioned that will produce a facility that should be serving the seniors in this community for 30 to 50 years. When you amortize that over that period of time and you look at 22% of our population with 0.78% of our annual budget being spent on the seniors, that's 0.78 on 22% of our population, I ask that you please do consider those numbers. And if you look at it in that light, I think that supporting this warrant article is, is a very wise thing to do. Thank you. Mr. Hannah, did you have a comment? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just want to I just want to clarify one thing that was said in that in that question. The four hundred and fifty thousand just doesn't get us an estimate of final cost. It gets us construction documents that allows us to go out to bid and give you the final cost of construction. I just want to make sure that's clear. Ms. Gilbert. I'd like to finish the letter that I began as an individual. During the discussion that we had at the school committee, many of the members individually expressed a variety of reasons of why they support our seniors and how valuable they are in our community. We talk a lot about money, but we don't talk about what's really important in some instances, and this might be one of them. So please allow me to express my, why I brought this discussion in the first place to the school committee for consideration. We live in a world with an increasing number of families now living in multi-generation households with grandparents younger than ever. There are many benefits that can be found in bridging the gaps between the seniors and our students. Our seniors are direct connection to our town history and family heritage. They have the ability to bring our country's rich history back to life through stories and experiences. The evidence can be found in the faces of the wide-eyed student as they listen to seniors share stories about historic moments such as World War II, the Holocaust, John F. Kennedy's death. There's no book on earth that can compare with these interactive experiences that these seniors provide our students. We really need to start thinking about that, their value. Our students have the ability to also give back to seniors and often do. They energize seniors through teaching of new digital skills, provide new experiences that promote a sense of new purpose to our seniors, purpose that can reduce the isolation of demographics. Both our students and our seniors need our support. It's not one or the other. The community doesn't need to be divided, and I urge Groton voters to come tonight and support us both. Thank you. Down front, Mr. Prest. Mr. Prest, please. Hi, I'm Linwood Valentine Prest. Everybody knows me as Val. Well, I am responsible for the building that everybody says is not ADA complex, complete. Well, that's because it was done in the late 1980s. And as a consequence, the laws then did not have all of the requirements that it has now. I worked with a contractor who worked with the VFW to come out with all of the requirements that they needed. And I put them into drawings, architectural. I'm a civil and structural engineer, have been for over 60 years. Oh, by the way, Mr. Moderator, uh, yes, your 40-year-old limit, I'm double that. So I just wanted you to know that I have a good deal of experience and the drawings that I created for that VFW building, which is now the senior center, is in the hands of the town of Groton. I gave it to them back at the first part of the year. And to the extent of costs that are included in the future, 
Every one of you who have ever designed a home or had a home designed for you know that you had to have that first before you could get a price on what the house was going to cost. We are no different in this situation. But we have a situation at the moment where we have a $310,000 estimate by the architect. But that also includes not just the design of the building that we're talking about, renovations, etc., but some of the study that has to go before that. But let's assume that the $310,000 is the design fee. That represents between 10 and 12% of the architect's fee for the design. Assuming that the building is 10,000, halfway between the nine and 11, the cost of the building would equate to three, to uh, 3 million 100, excuse me, 300, 3 million 100,000 dollars. And if it were 12%, that would be 3 million 720,000. For a 10,000 square foot building, that equates to 310 to 372 dollars a square foot. So that gives you an idea of the square foot cost and the overall cost. And as a structural engineer, out of that 10%, I got one. But I want you to know that for seniors, I'm one of them. It's worth it. Pay it now and get the blessings later from these people who have supported this town for so long and are still paying taxes. Thank you. In the back, yes ma'am. Um, my name is Gina Cronin. I live at 15 Gilson Road. Um, I work as a paralegal and I specialize in helping seniors get on Medicaid. And I travel to many senior centers in the area. And I can't tell you how important it is to have a vibrant and safe uh, senior center for our seniors to go to. It's a safety net. Um, it allows people to stay social. It allows people to get the services that they need to stay in their homes longer, or even get services if they have to move to an assisted living or a nursing home. Right now, we have a building that is probably deterring those who most need it to come so that they can have that safety net of people seeing how they're doing. Um, I'm about to come into my busiest time of year because everyone's traveling home to see mom and dad, and they didn't realize that maybe mom and dad couldn't live on their own anymore or need more services and more help from their community to stay in their homes. So I ask you to vote yes so that we can get the plans and see how much it's going to cost and that we can all come together in the spring and vote on a new senior center. Thank you. In the back, yes ma'am. Michelle Collette, um, ADA coordinator. I would like to respond to the previous question regarding uh, potential litigation for code compliance and non-compliance with Americans with Disabilities Act. As Val Prest said, uh, when the building was built, ADA had not been signed into law at the federal level. That happened in 1990. The remedy for um, complaints under the Americans with Disabilities Act is through the Department of Justice because the Americans with Disabilities Act is a civil rights law and by uh, violating ADA, you are depriving people from participating and depriving people of their civil rights. And typically, the Department of Justice orders communities to remedy the problem and uh, at whatever cost it takes, and it's a, and it's a directive, and it, that would be uh, the consequence of ignoring um, the issues that are um, compelling and need to be fixed at the existing senior center. Thank you. Down front, yes sir. So I've stood here a couple times and been a fairly vocal opponent against uh, some of the plans for the senior center because frankly for two reasons. I, I thought that what was being designed was too lavish and I thought that our actual planning process was not clear and open to the voters of the town. Uh, and I'm actually very heartened to hear that we're very frank with each other uh, about what we expect the final cost to be. Um, you know, my last time around that I stood here, my big problem was that we were, we had the exact same motion, where we're trying to uh, allocate funds for the design. 
And I don't know a lot about senior centers, but I know a little bit about building buildings, and the 10 to 12 percent, et cetera, was very familiar with me. And I looked at the numbers, and I say, this is, they're asking for a huge amount of money. They're asking for a little bit right now, and then they're going to ask for a huge amount of money for a really lavish center. And, and, and I really couldn't justify that. And, but I'm, I'm seeing something different tonight. That really heartens me, and I'm glad that we're being open about what we expect the final cost to be. And, I, and I'm really heartened to hear that we've changed our plans, that we've heard the voters, and we're looking to, to do something that is you know, more within our means. And you know, based on that, I'm, I'm really proud of the town tonight, and I'm proud that, that I can endorse this tonight, um, because I didn't before. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Moderator, Marion Stoddard, 59 Long Hill Road. I would like to move the question. The motion has been made, and I assume seconded, to move the question. If you vote in favor of moving the question, we'll move directly to voting on the main motion under Article 7. If you vote against moving the question, we will continue debate. A motion to move the question requires two-thirds majority. All those in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. By a two-thirds majority, we now move to the main motion under Article 7. All those in favor, it requires a majority vote, sorry. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 7 passes. Article 8, Mr. Deegan will do one more article, and then the chair will entertain a motion to adjourn for the evening and reconvene next week. Mr. Deegan, Article 8. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Before everybody leaves, we're about to spend half a million dollars. I move that the town vote to create a capital stabilization fund entitled Town of Groton Capital Stabilization Fund for the Groton Dunstable Regional School District and to transfer the sum of $500,000 from the Excess and Deficiency Fund free cash to be added to said fund. Article 8 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Deegan. So as I explained earlier when we were talking about the Municipal uh, Capital Stabilization Fund, we have a capital plan, and that capital plan has provisions for what's going to be needed in each... Point of order, yes? Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, as you leave, please be quiet. Mr. Deegan. It's very rare that somebody says they can't hear me, so I'll make sure that I speak up. Um, that said, earlier we spent money to replenish money in our capital stabilization fund, which to the best of my knowledge we've had for at least 25 years here in town, if not longer. We've been here 27 years. And I can't remember when it was created, but all I can tell you is that whether it's the town side or the school side, there's year-to-year -year reoccurring expenses. And then there are capital expenses. And in the case of the school district, they did yeoman's work in terms of creating and finally approving a long-term capital plan which addresses their capital needs so they will not be mixed with inside their operating uh, budget and ultimately the assessment to both Groton and the town of Dunstable. A couple years back, this town meeting approved a capital stabilization fund to be administered by the school district. However, uh, the town of Dunstable failed to approve the same article, and as a result, uh, there is no capital stabilization fund within the jurisdiction of the school committee and the district. What we are proposing by the wording of this article is to create a municipal capital stabilization fund for the Groton Dunstable Regional School District that is under the control of you, the town meeting voters. So when something comes forward from the district's capital plan, the portion that would go against Groton's assessment would come back before you folks as a motion within an article for say a new dump truck or whatever the capital need is, a burner, an HVAC unit. And there'd be different motions within that article. And this article currently calls for a majority vote to put the money in. 
However, when money would be removed in, under a warrant article, it would require a two-thirds vote of this town meeting. So, while the previous plan made a lot of sense uh, in its uh, iteration a couple years back, it failed to succeed. And as a result, there is no funding mechanism except for the school committee to come forward with their capital requests contained within their budget. This would alleviate that need, and it's something that last year I said that in my belief, and correct me if I'm wrong, Marlena, but I believe you had about $350,000 in capital last year that was included within your budget. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Um, I'll finish up and then Marlena may want to follow up on this. But the bottom line is, this is something that's sorely need, needed because the capital needs of the district have not been, in my opinion and many others, appropriately addressed. Um, and now we can do so and have transparency between their reoccurring year-to-year -year expenses and what their true capital needs are. So I urge you folks all to support this. The Finance Committee, to my recollection, uh, voted five to two in favor of creating this fund, but once they saw the five to two vote, they then voted unanimously to fund it. Uh, whereas the Board of Selectmen, we were unanimous in this. Um, and I urge you folks to support this, and it will uh, really be helpful for budgeting for the future. Also, one, one further point, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, the town of Dunstable need not approve this in their town. They're going to come forward, I believe, in the spring town meeting because they don't have a fall town meeting with a similar article. But the point is, is that if Groton's assessment is 77% of a specific capital item, we can fund our share out of the capital fund and Dunstable still can continue with whatever funding mechanism they need in order to meet their needs. So thank you. For the school committee, Ms. Gilbert. I just wanted to reiterate what Josh had mentioned in regards to a capital plan. We do have a capital plan. We do have one um, Warren article that's coming up after this to be funded, which is only a portion of what is looking to be coming up on Springtown meeting. We don't have a funding mechanism to pay that except for our assessment. By putting it in our assessment, which is our operating budget, we are basically growing an operating budget and it's not as transparent as separating the two. You can truly see where the growth is with the operating budget if it's separated out, and you can truly see where the capital items are spent in regards to that, besides the fact that it actually sets money aside specifically for capital expenses, so they will be spent towards capital needs. Are there any questions under Article 8? See someone going to the microphone. Yes, sir. Yes, Rodney Hirsch, uh, Bridge Street, uh, asking, speaking as a uh, private citizen. I just had a question to follow up on Josh's comments on uh, Groton's assessment of 77%. And if there were a capital need, say, say, for example, an HVAC unit that is needed, and the voters of Groton approve by two-thirds, but Dunstable turns it down, what happens? Do we buy two-thirds of an AC unit? It doesn't get funded. I, I'm, say again, please. It doesn't get funded. Does not. Thank you. Are there any other questions under Article 8? Yes, sir. Just a, a question. Is there a sinking fund that, uh, that es helps to estimate the, uh, the cost of capital over time so that you're amortizing the costs in, in, in the process? And uh, when, when expected capital expenses come up, uh, they will be, there will be sufficient funds in the sinking fund to, to carry, carry it. For instance, like a new roof on a building, we know the, the new roof is going to last X number of years and, and it should be funded in advance and not, uh, not you know, all at once. I can speak for the municipal side, but for the school side, because the capital plan is new and just recently approved, there are some very large ticket items on there. One of them is the replacement of Florence Roach School. And the replacement of Florence Roach School required a, um, a application by the administration to the municipal building fund in the state. They're waiting to hear if they're going to get on the list for reimbursement. I think they're going to find out by the end of this year. Is that correct? 
Okay, so the point being is that we would not use this capital, capital stabilization fund, of course we could use a piece of it in terms of something like that, but for a very large ticket item, such as what a new school cost would be, that is a debt exclusion vote typically, and that's something that would be brought forward. And a, and a point of reference uh, or something that's important to note is that we have a new regional district agreement in place now that was approved in the past year, and that because Florence Roach is owned by the town of Groton and all the students that attend it are Groton students, that that is one building that Groton is solely responsible for, for without Dunstable's participation. Um, so any needs that would come up for Florence Roach between now and if the building was approved by the uh, State Municipal Building Authority uh, could be funded as well through this and that would not require an affirmative vote from Dunstable. Is that fair? I, I was actually asking the school committee. That's all very good that's information. Ac that also. is accurate. That's okay. good information, but uh, in terms of a sinking fund for normal anticipated capital expenses, is that in, is that, does that exist here? Does it, you know? I can't speak for the administration. I'm going to uh, allow them to answer that question. Mr. Robertson, maybe you could shed some light on this. It, I can't speak for the municipal, but I would be assuming in a five-year plan, no, there is not a, a, a sinking schedule in regards to anticipated cost. Ours is actually only five years in length, and we, we've gotten recent bids to form this capital plan, so you can't get any more accurate than we are today. Mr. Robertson? Yeah, yeah. In, in, on the municipal side, we have a 10-year plan, like the school now has a five-year plan, but when we look at those 10-year plans, we look at what's the cash requirement or the debt requirement in that, and debt for the, something large like a, like a senior center, et cetera, would be a, a separate aside. So a sinking fund to set up, we effectively have a cash, free cash rolling forward fund that uses looking forward three years out to say, should we have more cash, which is one of the reasons we don't want to give cash back to taxpayers because we want to keep the cash for just what you're talking about. We don't have an official sinking fund, but we have cash management year to year to year looking out three to five years that says we know we're going to need money for this. We know we're going to need 300000 for that because we have a 10-year plan. So we're using the cash, free cash, to fund those specific items that are coming up in the future. So even though it's not a sinking fund, it acts like a sinking fund by looking forward and keeping the cash flow in our pockets to make sure we can fund the stuff we know are coming up. We always have surprises, but we at least know the big items that are coming up and we use two things, cash flow for one, free cash, and then we use debt for the bigger ones, which we can't ever use probably out of free cash. There's just not enough of it. Are there other questions under Article 8? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor of the main motion under Article 8 signify by saying aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 8 passes by a majority vote. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the, the chair is willing to stay here all night if a majority of you wishes to finish. Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Pine. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move that we adjourn this town meeting to next Monday night at 7 o'clock in this room for the uh, rest of the warrant. There is a motion to adjourn to Monday, October 30th at 7 p.m. here in the middle school. It has been moved and seconded. Are there any questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. The meeting is adjourned until Monday, October 30th at 7 p.m. in the middle school.